it's a great pleasure to welcome all uh, to this uh, defragmentation training school in uh, biomedical analysis. So the organization um, included many other people. So you will see there is a uh, Paolo Sampaio from uh, the Advanced Lyme Microscopy uh, EPMC uh, in Porto, uh, Mafalda Souza, uh, Clara Pratt, uh, Associate Professor uh, in uh, Copenhagen, uh, and um, um, Marion uh, Lou. And also we are, uh, let's say, led by a very good scientific uh, advisory board, including Julian Colombelli, Paolo Sampaio, uh, Julia Fernandez Rodriguez, and uh, Gabby Martin. So uh, regarding today, this is the program. Uh, we will uh, start uh, with a few talks uh, about uh, what is uh, bioimage analysis and what is um, an image that has to do with uh, life science. We will have an example of bioimage analysis as a service from neurobioimaging. And we will have a lesson about Jupyter Notebooks uh, by uh, Guillaume Leeds. Um, before we start, I would like just uh, to ask Anna in the audience uh, to introduce ourselves and the company. So for this training school, we will be helped to archive the training material and do the video editing by the Shivis company. Thank you. So thank you, Rocco, and uh, uh, hello to everyone. Um, Rocco asked me to introduce myself because uh, more of the fact that we will discuss also career um, path in the bio image analysis world. So um, my career path hasn't been traditional in any sense, but um, yeah, I define it more like a adventurous journey um, through the working life. So, but um, five years ago, there was a changing event in my career, and this was the participation to the training school um, organized by New Bias. So, five years ago, I fell in love with bioimage analysis and uh, with the bioimage analysis community. And uh, today, I am founder, co founder of a company, Shivis, that wants to support researchers in their bioimage analysis journey, but also data journey in, uh, in general. So if you want to talk a little bit about challenges of uh, the freelancing life um, as a bioimage analyst, um, please contact me. So I will put maybe my email in the chat. Thank you, Rocco. So now we can start with uh, Julia. Julia, you are ready to present. I will be the one, maybe the one that will not talk about how to do image analysis and introduce image analysis, but I can introduce the problem we have uh, once we're running a facility that produces many images and what we have to do with that. And then just let me share my screen and try to start. And yes, that's the title. I will base, of course, our our discussion in all the experience I have. I have been running this core facility called the Center for Cellular Imaging that is sitting at the Salgrensk Academy that is the medical faculty at the University of Gothenburg. And uh, I have been here for the uh, last, uh, in this facility for the last 20 years. Uh, that means that I think I have quite a lot of experience. I would say my background is in cell and molecular biology, and I will be the hardcore microscopist. And at some points, in some moments of the time that I have been helping and training our users, I, I have to deal a little bit with image analysis, but I never have the lucky as any of you to have the neo -bias and to be able to be trained by them. Maybe at this moment, I will not have been a hardcore microscopy, but maybe a bioimage analyst. In any case, okay, let's go. The first image I want to show, when you have a multimodal uh, facility, and where we, what do I mean with that? I mean, it's a facility that we have different type of imaging uh, modalities that go for, in this case for us, um, light microscopy, and you probably will base a lot uh, the, in this course on uh, analysis on image, uh, images coming from the light microscopes in whatever flavor, confocal, conventional, multiphoto, or super resolution. We do have as well uh, electron microscopy. We want to increase really resolution. We really need to go uh, to um, an electron microscope. And in between them, we are now dealing as well, and, and, and thank you to George Harinder, his associate professor here in the University of Gothenburg, uh, sitting as well uh, in the faculty, 
that they have also allowed us and, uh, um, to uh, offer to our users the MALDI imaging mass spectrometry. And obviously, when you have all these type of modalities, you need to do something because you, you need to analyze, you need to process them, and you need to make integrate all the modalities. I mean, that's my dream. This is what I want. And in the end, in the summary, where we'll say that my dream as a head of a facility that running a multimodal facility is to have a platform where I can put images coming from different instruments and try to fuse them or to uh, align them or to register them to each other and to make it sense from the whole for the whole um, images that we get into the facility. Uh, the mission, of course, I will just enter very, very briefly, but they ask, you know, what we're doing here and what that means on the facility, just for the ones that, yeah, maybe some people I see recognize some face that working in facility, but many of you probably working in a in the labs, in research labs. Of course, we're servicing our, our users and we call users because we actually give access to the microscopes. We're training the people how to use these microscopes and they can, and we, they keep our, of course, our support all the way from the day that we design the experiment to the day that they need to do the preparing the samples and the images for image analysis. Of course, the training is actually a very strong um, activity and uh, uh, important service we have in the facility. As I say, we, we sort of have to train in our system, uh, our people, uh, users on the microscope, but also in the sample preparation and also in image analysis. Obviously, we have to uh, organize events as this one that we are right now, now, but also on-site events. And I'm just telling you that we just finished this one event uh, where some people here, like Kota, that will be the next speaker, have been as well a training in a course and the introduction in image analysis that we have done just here in Gothenburg. And of course, we have to innovate and we have to uh, uh, do method development either on uh, in, in microscopy by doing correlation in different flavors or image analysis. We also have some microfabrication. Obviously, you need to get this innovation to try to, uh, to, to get new methods or new technologies that can be offered to our users. And this is just a collage of images that they can show you what I meant with all the multimodality and where all the, the, the work that we do in, in the facility, obviously training our users, teaching our users online, training our users even online as well sometimes, training the users on site, sample preparation, and, uh, and both flavors in the line microscope and in the electron microscope. But now, once we have all these modalities, and this is a little bit to show you in a schematic way how we try to manage uh, and, and in a way support the analysis once we have all these uh, type of images. I will go very, very fast. Uh, it's just only to give you a glimpse of how we do it here. Uh, we acquire the images in our microscopes, users or staff, these images that go. If the user have all those solutions in their side, they just are, their images are just transferred through a NAS server to their solutions, whatever it is, and they do the analysis. We do have a high speed workstations as well inside the facility itself, where people can work uh, directly in the facility, where we have different uh, uh, programs that they can use for analyze commercials and uh, open sources and they as well of course can connect later with the image repositories if that's what they want or they can go to the data solution but also we have the possibility that we acquire the images and they go to our uh, processing server that in this case we have a hive actually it's bigger than that one <laughs> have three actually right now we have five blocks uh, similar to that where we have different programs uh, that the uh, uh, analysts in our in our facility, in this case, Rafael, uh, is helping the users uh, in the analysis of the images, on the process of the images, if that is necessary in cases like we have when we do super resolution structural illumination or single molecule localization. Uh, the uh, beautiful part here is the, 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 um, uh, the work it's not only done from one side where the analyst, but also uh, there is a remote access from our users through this system. And both analysts and users can actually discuss uh, on fly, uh, uh, one in their lab or in their home or whatever they are at that moment, 
and the other, uh, the operator and the analyst here in the, in the facility. And we can, of course, we have been, um, and we are, and this is a work, a work in progress. Uh, we still are on, on, especially for the multimodal part, we are actually as well uh, partnering or working together with Cytomine and with Omero and Appear. This is just uh, very briefly how we do. But let's go to the images and what do we, uh, how we get these images. And I want that you, you see here the power where you have when you have a multimodal facility that you might have to correlate or not correlate. And when I correlate, I mean in that you use the same sample and that same sample go in every modality, imaging modality. You can also change modalities without saying exactly the same sample, but the same model organism or the same uh, cells. And here is just an appreciation, uh, uh, um, uh, display of different technologies. We don't have the MRI systems, uh, but do we uh, do we partner with? Uh, and I will show you in some of the examples I have during the uh, presentation where we actually have partners in Europe that they do the MRI. This is just the brain. In this case, actually, the human brain is what you see here. It's going all the way for the MRI. And here is a line microscopy, in this case, polarization microscopy, and going to two photon uh, confocal microscopy, and finally in the transmission uh, electro or scanning electromicroscopes. As you see here, we have different scales, scales that go also in, in the hyperspectral space, but also in the spatial space, and we have uh, a combination of all of them. Each modality is going to give you, um, would you answer part of these questions, and the beauty of the multimodality is put all that together to be able to answer a particular biological question. Um, once we have, and I want to use this, uh, uh, Agoris, that is, of course, uh, we are not working with Lego, but it, it, it helped actually quite a lot. And I will use what Rafael have done it in his um, in his talks because he, he have kids. He have two kids. I don't have the kids, but he have two kids and then he's playing a lot with Lego. Then uh, we, when we study multimodality, we have several images that come from the different modalities. And that means that we have different formats and sides. Then the first thing that we need to do is to, decide to, to, to sort it and to arrange it. We have to register, we have to see which one is coming from which. The problem as well we ended at is that it, once you generate this data, sometimes this data can be several terabytes. It's not like four Legos, but thousands of Legos together. That means that we actually had to try to sort it, arrange it, and try to put it in a some kind of visualization mode that they might not be, because the idea is to go to explain the full story. But in the most of the cases we ended at here, when we just present vis visually our images. And why is that the problem to actually get here is because once you have different si different images with different size and you have to do uh, many operations, this can be a challenging in a big data. Uh, because sometimes many of the computers uh, actually working on the RAM and is limited by that, where it means that you have the problem and the topic of the BA big imaging and you will uh, we will have a speakers that they will introduce that um, introduce that uh, in, in the image analysis work for you and I just only show you the story of having all the data and once one of the good things when we processing it actually uh, that sometimes the the, the post-process data will be orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the raw data where it make it actually easy to handle it Unfortunately, even so that I tell the story in that way, I might be perfect that we will get to explain and the full story and we get a house with a garden and the uh, grass cutting. This is not the reality. And now I'm showing you the reality where you have me in the middle or Rafael or any of our people that are helping us with the image analysis from the multimodal. This is where we have all these pieces that are coming around and we have to try to make a uh, a story for all these pieces because when I say we have different formats and size I say I mean because you say electro microscope and a light microscope the images that come from there is not the same and it's not only related to the format itself but also even to the biological interpretation 
and just to make it now images let's go back to images and leave the lego and this is just some examples that we have done in the facility where we are mixing and when i say multimodality you have to mix at least two three or four different uh, imaging modalities in this case for example we, we we actually have worked with the transmission electron microscope and the nanosine uh, in this case is line microscopy and electron microscopy in this case, it's just a multiphoto microscope that allow us to generate second harmonic generations and out of fluorescent, fluorescent. This is human skin, and this is the cells from the epidermis, and this is the collagen that we have on this on the skin. Or we can do the usual correlative light electron microscopy that people have worked. And we, as as I told you before, that we also have the possibility to work with people doing imaging mass spectrometry. We actually, of course, have combined the imaging mass spectrometry with with, a, with our confocal microscopy. I will go now by, by examples, a bit longer examples on how we have been dealing and, and which programs. And you will see that once we have, uh, and that's why I show you the allegory with me in the middle of all these Lego pieces, uh, because what happened as well, and that will be probably more Rafael, our analyst, when you uh, have images coming from the line microscope, from the electron microscope, from the imaging mass spectrometry, and you don't have one defined tool or platform that allows to control to, to to deal with all the images in once, is that you have to deal with different programs for the different things you want to do with each of these images. This is an example of a workflow where we started from the line microscope and go to the electron microscope and we do different uh, line microscopy technologies uh, methods and going to high resolution uh, images uh, in this case we're using a project and where we have mapping the lipid droplets associated proteins in the context of non-alcoholic fatty diseases uh, this is a, a cell line that I will, in a couple of seconds, I will show you uh, how we actually got in there. This is the original question. We have a particular protein that we were interested in. Uh, the, the, the data are not published. That's why you don't get the name of the protein. Sorry. Uh, we have a proteins that actually uh, moving uh, in this particular case, once you are using oleic acid to... Uh, increase the amount of lipid droplets in the cells. This is HeLa cells. It's nothing uh, extraordinary or fancy uh, cell line. And once you use the lipid, the oleic, oleic acid for four hours, the the protein is moving from the Golgi apparatus to the to the lipid droplets around the lipid droplets. We, we see that a bit clear here, and we want to know why is that happening and if they are really around the lipid droplets, because this is a resolution of the line microscope. And this is telling me really around, but not necessary as a part of the membrane of the lipid droplets. To do that, I really need to go to the electron microscope. And what we did in the group is to establish a cell line. Uh, this in this case, they have two nitri cells that have GFP, and, uh, and that uh, a protein that have a lipid droplets associated protein. This is how we were going to call it from now on. And once we do, this is how the cell line look at. And this is a inducible system that I can induce this lipid droplet associated protein will be in the cytosol. And once I use the oleic acid, as you see, they go around the lipid droplets. We have a tool now that is our cell line where we have GFP, where we can follow easily on the light microscope. But how to go to the electron microscope? Because I say we will do correlation. We will want to check at a much higher resolution how we can go there. Well, we got a tour, thank you to, to really good friends as well in Belgium, and probably some of you know them, uh, Saskia Lippens and Sebastian Munk in Lev and Ghent. Uh, they have a fantastic tool uh, that is a nanobody that have in one side M Cherry. This nanobody is against GFP, and in the other side have the Apex 2. As you see from one side, they have M Cherry. That means that I can see which of my cells are positive transfected. Once I transfected this plasmid that have the nanobody, this plasmid that this nanobody will recognize the GFP. This is my GFP. This is my nanobody. And as you see, they match quite nicely. And there is one more extra molecule here that is very important for me. That is the apex. 
and that's the one that will be glowing on the electron microscope. As you know, normally the, one of the problems on electron microscopy is the specificity, that that's what we normally have on line microscopy when we use antibodies. Well, if you use APEX2, that is an ascorbate peroxidase, uh, will allow us actually to, with high resolution, to visualize molecules inside the cells, as we see here. Obviously, what happened here is that you use, you fix your cells, you put the, the amino density in the, in, the, in the media where you have the cells fixed and the reactions, this will produce uh, oxidized the peroxidase and it gives us an electron dense uh, precipitate or polymer that we can see easily in the electron microscope. As you see now, I have gave a specificity from the light to the electron microscope and now I can correctly check, this is the controlled cells, this is my positive cells that we have our fantastic or funny or interesting protein and we can see actually that they are around the lipid droplets and it's a little bit outside the lipid droplets in that it's not a diffusion of the apex but it's actually uh, this molecule we are looking on the around the lipid droplets is also in the cytosol but it's quite accumulated in this area, very close to the lipid droplets. Okay, the first question, if that protein is around the lipid droplets is answered. Yes, we have it around the lipid droplets. And I see you here that you can see that we have used different programs. And now this is just a claim where we have in one side the fluorescent, in another side the apex, and this is the combination of both the apex two and the fluorescent that we have taking images from the GFP. And in the top of the, if you see here, we can see the different programs that we have to use to uh, uh, imaging the samples, to get a proper uh, image from the line microscope, and to get an image from the electron microscope, to actually uh, align those, uh, align those samples, organize, align, register, and give us you the, quest, the, the picture now where we can uh, uh, overlay practically the, the green fluorescent protein and, and the apex two. And you say, oh, but that's very simple. No, because the resolutions in these two, mole, in two images are very different. And we have tried to do, and that's why we have to use different programs that allow us to actually match and to register and to correct the formations. Because unfortunately, when we had to prepare for electron microscopy and cutting thin sections, they might be deformations. And also keep, keep in, in, in mind that when we take images here, this is hydrated samples. They just have thin fix and you look at it in the microscope. But to take pictures here, I have to dehydrate because I have to embed these samples in, in plastic, in resins. And that means that there is a shrink from this situation to this situation that also we need to have in consideration when we do all the analysis. I, I have actually writing, if you have seen uh, at the same time that I do uh, lecturing, uh, the dimensions of the different uh, images that we have here, the individual image, this image and this image, this is around, this is the camera. The camera is a 4K, 4K on the transmission electron microscope. And this is the, the, the pixel size, the, the number of pixels we actually have for our line microscope in this particular case. And then of course we can make it a bit more. I just show you a, a cleanse where we actually uh, find the lipid droplets directly but, uh, uh, and in both in light and electron microscope, but we actually have work as well. And in this case, you have the name here. This is r one This is an enzyme that is around uh, the Golgi apparatus, uh, as you see here, and this is a Golgi. Uh, this is a different cell line. Uh, th this is a cell line that actually express as well r one GFP, and that's why we see here in green color. The red color is the M sherry from the nanobody. And then of course we have used as well the same technology using the nanobody with Apex2 and, and the M sherry. We, we sort of recognize what is the positive cell by uh, the M sherry. Uh, we see here now we have a yellow color. There is a combination and there in between. And now we can go uh, to our um, uh, electron microscope, prepare the sample. Of course, in between this uh, uh, picture and this picture, it has been a long preparation time. And we get to this case where we can actually really, really with high resolution go and pinpoint what actually is this enzyme sitting. It's not just everywhere in the Golgi, but only in the areas where the vesicles are forming. 
And why is there? Because Argaguam is actually the enzyme that we remove the coating that vesicles have. And that's important to you remove this coating to be able to, once this vesicle is forming, they can fuse with the next membrane. If you don't remove the coating, it will not be fusion. That will be impossible. Then Argaguam is doing that job, and now we can see clearly where it actually is sitting. Um, another example that we go uh, as well, uh, where we're doing this, this time, where it's called the correlative array tomography and that we try to go from end-to-end -end data management and when I say end-to-end -end, I'd include that also the sample preparation. I will show you two, uh, two examples from one side the kidney and uh, that's as well from human samples and the human skin equivalent samples. Let's start here, a very busy uh, slide, uh, but it's just showing you the full workflow we have to do to actually uh, acquiring the images. From one side, we have to prepare the samples and we get litis. Now you can see uh, what I was discussing you or just explaining to you that in EM, we have to embed it in resins. This is how these bullets, we call like bullets because really very much look like a bullet. And here we have our tiny, tiny, tiny sample. And once we are preparing the sample in this way, this is just, for example, a piece of the sample. And in this case, in this particular case, is actually the kidneys, the piece of the kidney. Once we have it here and we want to do a ray tomography, meaning that we want to take, as you see here, a ribbon of uh, to, to be able to do 3D volume EM as well, not electro, not only line microscopy. We have a special um, a special knife and a special devices that call this in the autotome. As you see, it's like a tape, and the samples are cutting and catching by the tape. And you can make these rollings. You can see here the samples, and then now you can see that we can tape this in our in our special cassettes that we can put inside either the light microscope or the electron microscope. And this one, in this particular case, this section that you see here is the same section that we use for light microscopy and from EM. We can use a special resins and in this case acrylates that will allow us to do uh, labeling with antibodies, as you see here. This is just a uh, alkaline phosphatase or HRP, sorry, sorry for that, it's just HRP, uh, quite similar to the apex, it's also uh, peroxidase. And we get this yellow, this brownish color, and that's the particular cell that we were interested in. And after we can go to the electron microscope and actually find exactly that particular cell. That's the idea with the um, with the array tomography. It's not just only to look at the single uh, cells, but to see this single cell in a ribbon like this and take images in this region of interest from this particular cell and do the 3D reconstruction. I was just show you now, for example, once uh, we have taken and acquiring these images, and the majority of the time we actually streaming these images from the um, uh, light and the electron microscope into the hive uh, to do already the analysis there. Uh, we have the programs that they are needed for, uh, for the analysis and the processing inside the hive. And, and here is just an example on how that will look. We have the light microscope, now we actually go into the cell and now this is our electron microscope and we go more and more and more until we get a cell. And as you see here, we have used different programs like Send Blue uh, for acquisition of the images and, con and taking a little bit care uh, on the images on the Send. Send Connect is allowing us to do this visualization that you see right now. It's just mainly visualization in where we can put images on top of each other uh, and align and organize and overlay a little bit. This is not a pure fine, fine alignment. If we want to do more alignment, we will have to work. That's why Fiji is in the middle. Then XenConnect will allow to connect us the images, but to do the fine tuning, we have to use uh, Fiji. And of course, uh, this is in remote access. That means that if our users are sitting in somewhere else, that it can actually work with us and uh, trying to processing and analyze these images together on the on the same machines. 
and just happen. Uh, I just show you one more example uh, because uh, here we have to use an extra program as well. We do use uh, the atlas to acquire in, in the sand and to do the 3D reconstruction. You will see in the video now, right now, we need, we will do the same, use the same connect as well to connect all these images. We have to use Fiji to overlay and Amira to do the 3D, re 3D rendering. This is just the overview of what a ray tomography means. You have now, you see here, you have different sections. Now the machine is going from one section to another one, taking a particular image of this. This is uh, algae. We have taken one image, the second image, the third image, and now we try to reconstruct and now we get our, our Golgi and the uh, chloroplast. Then as you see here, we have to include a lot. The Atlas is the program that you see in the background that is see, allow us to see easily and also to navigate into the different sections and to acquire in the images in, the, in, the, in each of region of interest. Once we are there, in this particular case, we don't have a correlative approach. We just have an array approach. But as the same, we have to use several softwares to actually fi finalize, the, finalize the question. Uh, the other proje uh, project that I was going to talk about is the skin project that we do as well uh, with the groups uh, around Europe. And in this case, it's an equivalent. This is not a piece of skin, but it's what they call a skin equivalence. Uh, the laboratory, the lab is growing the skin. This is a collagen, bovine collagen, and they grow in the cells that mimicking the different layers of the skin, the epidermis and the dermis. And that's what we have here. Our job here was to prepare samples that was coming for that lab in, uh, in uh, Austria, in Vienna, and uh, try to preserve the fluorescent. We also have, uh, we want to correlate in between light and electron microscope. And in this case, uh, the cells that they were interesting, it was labeled. It's these positive ones that you see here. You see very strong here, but this is the, Stratum corneum, this is our surface in the skin that is mainly dead cells and that's why it's so bright. It's not because all the positive cells are here, it's just because when cells start dying, they becoming really out of fluorescent. And then here we can see that we see our positive cells clearly after the preparation for electron microscopy and um, where it was uh, very, very nice and surprising for us because it was the first time that we tried with this fluorophore and we managed to make it work. As you see here, we have, this is a light microscope and we have taken images in this particular case with transmitted light, but I will show you straight away once that we have done a reflection light would allow us to see as well, very well the images. As you see, you start to have file formats. The, this is the file formats that we have been using and the resolution we get, obviously now we are in the fluorescent microscope, the resolution is a bit lower and we start to get a, a, a quite big images because this is actually quite big. As you see, this is just 100 microns. We have several millimeters in this case. And this is just um, uh, taking an array tomography from the line microscope. And as I say, in one side, you have the skin, the fluorescent. This is a reflected light that we use because these uh, samples are sitting in a silica wafer. We cannot go to be conducted for the electron microscope. Uh, but we, we have seen that actually to use reflected light mode on the, in the line microscope, it have allowed us to actually uh, clearly register and uh, seeing very well the cells and, and, and pinpoint the positive cells here with the fluorescent. As you see uh, as well, we, we have to use different programs to, uh, to look at and to uh, analyze it. And we have to actually ask the big warp on the Fiji to be able to take in consideration the tensions and the transformations and the rigidness that happens in the samples once we, because sometimes even so that we have the same sample, when we go to the electron microscope for the fat of the cutting, uh, we actually see certain deformations that we need to have in consideration. And here you will see that now things start to fly and moving is because we have done a 3D reconstruction in this, uh, here is the, this, uh, the sections that we have as an array. And now we have to go 
to the, and then of course you see the files start to get bigger and bigger, 12 gigabytes per section. And, and sometimes you see this is this tiny area. It's not even all the millimeters that we have here. And now it's the same, the same sample I just showed you with the line microscope, but to in the electron microscope, where we can actually now as do, do the 3D reconstruction on these sections that you see here. Uh, we have again uh, to use several programs to be able to uh, align, to, to organize, to register, to align and to overlay. And at the end, obviously, what we want to do, and then of course we have to increase the number of uh, programs uh, and uh, tools that we use. I think they will talk, my colleagues during this course, will talk about all of them and explain to them, uh, explain to you how they will work. But we have to do in that way as well to or organize all them to be able to get to the end, that is overlay, uh, to organize, to register, to align and to overlay the images once you will go to the correlative. In this case, you see that we actually do a uh, small 3D, uh, oh, sorry, yes, going again, running again. It's going so fast because it's actually just only five sections but we have followed the cells because actually now what we want to see is these cells, the positive cells that they are fluorescent, the difference in between these ones and the cells that they are not fluorescent. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is just a summary of all where we have. We have our sample sitting in a silica wafer with an array. We talk, take these images on the line microscope. We check that we have a positive samples. We align these samples and we finally go to the electron microscope. This is a project I want to show that is it's a bit more complex and it definitely this is still ongoing, uh, but I would like to, to bring you because now I have talked about multimodality in our facility, but actually we can bring this multimodality at the European level. Let's put it in this way. Now I have one particular technique that I'm very good. And my colleagues in Vienna have another technique that is, they are extremely experts and another ones in Germany and another ones in Madrid. And that's where we did. And we actually have moved the, the sample around Europe and taking images in each of these uh, it's, uh, centers uh, with, the, with the best expertise for that. The, the idea of this multimodal across scale approach is to, uh, to do the same study on the human brain. The images I'm going to show you today is on mouse brain because we use that as the proof of concept to check the experimental setup that the logistics, because there is a logistics here to send sample around the, around Europe, it everything work as should be. And once we have the full workflow done, thus we will end it up with um, we will go with the human with the human sample. Uh, what we call this project is the big multimodal high resolution atlas data management because it will be enormous work here on the data management once we start with a real story. And I will just show you the story and I will hope that maybe next year if we have a course and I had the possibility to meet you again, I can show you probably data that they have been uh, you, um, getting data from the, from, the, from the human sample. This is where we have. This is the, the brain where we started. And this is actually, as you see here clearly, we are actually um, uh, partnering with, a, with the groups that they are part of the human brain project and the human connectome. And of course, what we're trying to do is to try to make a comprehensive description of the, how the neurons and the brain regions are actually interconnected. How all these fibers and to all these neural networks are actually interconnected. That will be the, 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 the end of the, uh, the project if they get there, because actually human brain is extremely big for some, especially some technologies like electromicroscopy. But uh, in any case, uh, we are trying to, to be a little bit one part on all this uh, human brain or human connectome. This is the team. Uh, behind the project, as I told you, uh, the, the, the sample will go to different areas in Europe. We have car size is actually as well here and they actually have been the, the, the ones connecting the scientists uh, for using, of course, some of their technologies because many of us have the technologies, but some groups that they don't have their technologies. 
Uh, our group here in Gothenburg, uh, we have the group in Vienna, we have a group in Madrid with Javier and Angel, and the group in, in Julish in uh, Germany, and they are the ones actually belong to the human connectome, that's what they do in Julish. Uh, Marcus and Catherine are the main, uh, she's the director and he's the leader, the scientific leader and, and he, uh, Sabine and Marcus, actually part of the team of Marcus. As you see, we really need expertise and now we don't have multimodal in our facility but we have multimodal around uh, in Europe. And this is the beginning of the whole story and here is Marcus and Frederick, his uh, student. Um, where they start, and, and he's a physicist actually in background, um, the study they do, the microscopy they do after the MRI, as you see here, is a polarized light microscopy. Here you can have the fibers, and this is where we want to actually uh, look at how these fibers are defined and how they are uh, characterized, these fibers. Uh, this is a little bit what uh, uh, Marcus liked to call uh, toward the nested human connectome. We need to nest it, that means they have to have a hierarchical organization, we need to check that. We, we, need, we have multi-scale objects, at uh, some point polarized microscopy will not give the resolution and we, will we want to take all these in the 3D space. Definitely we want a multimodal imaging approach. And this is what we have to do now. This is space here is exactly this area here. And we start with an area of the brain where we try to understand the composition of these neural tissues, to reveal the local connectivity between the neurons, to cross-validate and interpret the data that will come from different modalities. Definitely in this project, data management and data processing analysis is going to be very big a part of the project. And of course, to try to inspire the simulation and modeling. Uh, to do that, we need to have imaging to the cellular, but also to the subcellular level. And uh, we want to do on the same brain tissue, uh, going all the way to all the labs. Uh, of course, uh, we know that we will need to do with a subset part of a uh, subsample. It will not be the full for the moment, but we will align uh, line on the on the big picture because we will have the MRI pictures uh, images from from the brain and of course we will require a big data management and handling but it's not only experimental problem we have a logistic problem I just showed you where it go the sample go from Germany in Julish to Gothenburg where we are here where we will prepare the electron microscopy samples they have done the polarized microscopy here we will prepare samples for electron and the X-rays. Once it's prepared uh, for uh, electron and X-rays, they will go to Vienna uh, for imaging on the X-rays. Once they finish imaging, they go back to us in, um, in Sweden, and we will cut uh, in an array fashion, array tomography for our uh, single beam microscope and look at the same areas that they have seen here on the X-rays and find a, and, and try to see where they are there in the 3D. And these images, these uh, sections that we are cutting here, it will go to Germany again, and that's where size over Cohen enter, because they have a microscope they have to call the multi-beam. Uh, it's, a, it's a scanning electron microscope that have 91 electron beams. That means this microscope go 100 times faster than my microscope here in Gothenburg. That's why this will be very good to do big areas of the brain, that that's what we want to do. Uh, not just a tiny area, but big areas, and the, the multi beam will allow us. Once they finish, the samples will go to Madrid for doing a more fine and high, high resolution with a focus ion beam. And in the end, the data management will be done in between uh, Julish and us here. And, and the servers, I will discuss a little bit what will be the plan. Then we managed to image in the same tissue. We want to do several, uh, as I told you already, uh, different modalities, polarized, X-rays, uh, scanning electron microscopy, focus ion being a multi -sem. Uh, We will try to deal with infrastructures that will help us for the big data management. And of course, it is important to, and, and thus enter in the sample preparation, that we have the perfect workflows that prepare the samples that compromise the minimum uh, for the different modalities. 
And this is just how the sample went. This is uh, the polarized light. This is the area where Marcus and the team is interesting. We prepare on the resin. We have a tiny area here. That is this tiny area. This is the X-rays that our colleagues in Vienna have looked at. We can see that the preparation is going really, really well. I mean that they send us the samples with sectioning and we start to see now the area on the brain. Um, of course, we, we are very limited in a single beam. We will send it to the multi beam. This is the way the multi beam array work. It's like hexagons. They can do this in really minutes. Uh, that will be for us. Uh, Let's put it in this way. They told me something that it take for us uh, um, 20 years. It will take for them uh, five, uh, three months. And this is just telling you the speed. We will not be able to do the connect on with our multi beam. And here's how they look like. This will be one picture. This is one picture. This is what we get. And as you see in one shot, this is what the multi beam get. And this is just to go to high resolution uh, on the focus ion beam. Then I want to show you just uh, high resolution images that, uh, that um, Javier and Angel have taken. Now you see that we just navigate in the brain and see all the fibers that we will be interested in. And this will help us to modeling. They already have a uh, design a program they call Spina that is actually helping us easily to describe, to see where the synapses are. And, and we have the other project where it will be to really put together all the technologies. Here we have the polarize, the X-rays. This is a polarize. Now we go to the X-rays here. X-ray low resolution, X-ray high resolution, X-rays with more resolution, and this is the electron microscope with the highest resolution. And now you see as well, we have used the Atlas to navigate, the same connect to put the images and organize and overlay the samples. But the idea is to do that. Of course, this is only one section. It's not a 3D. The idea is to go in a full volume and probably use infrastructures as the e-brain and the phoenix. Probably some of you have heard about the e-brains and phoenix, especially the ones of you that work with the brain, uh, brain research. This is very much related to brain research. And some of you have maybe heard about the Phoenix. If you have not heard about the Phoenix and you actually need high computing data virtual machine services, uh, you can use it uh, for free. This is a research infrastructure that have uh, really supercomputers and that can help uh, researchers that they are in need of high computing. And the, the e-brain is actually part of the Phoenix and probably we will work in this or probably in uh, here as well on the specialists once we were, uh, have the access on the Phoenix. This is just to show you the different um, uh, supercomputers that have around you or the infrastructure. Uh, correlated model, I just go, just almost finishing. Um, I just showing you here uh, other multimodalities. This is just a paper that our collaborator York uh, have uh, got uh, in this year where we don't only uh, go multimodal with the light and electron microscope, but we are actually adding uh, the multi image mass spectrometry and the nano seeing and also the scanning electron microscope. You see, we're getting more and more uh, for the moment in this project that we have done, the, we have not done the full fusion in between the different modalities, but the idea will be actually to fuse the different modalities. Then, uh, as you see, getting more and more complex now, if you actually, and you will get uh, lectures about that where people do transcriptomics and omics and wants to actually uh, fuse it with a microscopy and with the imaging samples. Uh, but we have successful uh, work with the groups uh, in the AstraZeneca. This is a work directly with the companies, uh, with a company where we actually, they have actually a nano SIM system, nano secondary ion mass spectrometry, where you get very high resolution, but the preparation of the samples have to be like for electron microscopy. That's where you see here an electron microscopy picture from, from the transmission. This is our system and after the areas where they have found the particular um, uh, vesicles where they have the compounds, in this case the acids on the oligonucleotides, it's, a, it's a very important now for drug discovery and drug development on with the, all the nucleotides. You have an example, perfect example, the RNA we have the, in our vaccines from the COVID. 
And I just want to finalize with a summary here. And some of the things I will just throw in away to my colleagues there that they are the analysts and the developers. As we see, uh, CMI is a field under construction uh, and we are actually relying in a quite broad expertise, sample preparation, image acquisition, data processing and analysis. And all of us have to work together. We cannot work separate and, and try to get it uh, we really need to do, and we need to manage this, and this imaging process analysis need to be incorporated from the initial reflections of the project. In the first moment you decide the project, you have to start thinking how it's going to be processed and analyzed. And this dialogue in between the, uh, in between the, in between us, the microscopists and the scientists and the people have the research question and the analysts have to be constant and continued. And we have to understand, we have to make the communities understand each other and understand the requirements and the need from each other. Not only that the analysts understand what I want to do, but also I understand what the analysts need from me. And of course, uh, we, we would like to as much make uh, automated methods. The, the majority of the methods I show you here today, this is ad hoc. We have to develop on fly. There are not many that we just go here and I have a perfect method, a perfect project, a perfect program that will help me to analyze and to do my correlation and my overlap or my uh, registration. Then definitely we need to work uh, towards to get as much projects, programs that can ideally uh, take care of that and help us to process. Uh, this data and definitely machine learning and deep learning is going to be very important in this field uh, to, to push forward or at least to combine the ad hoc uh, methods that we do together with the machine learning and, and the deep learning. Uh, CMI, where we will do ideally, ideally, where I would like is that we lead towards to a multimodal platform where they allow functionality, structurality, and morphological characterization of entire sample in vivo, like, uh, brain, uh, like the brain we just discussed, or model organic cells or tissues, and they, they allow us to, to get as much information in a single platform, where we can actually fuse our modalities and we can have the machine learning or all the algorithms and products in, in one particular platform where all the different tools that they are, uh, they, are develop, they are developed by developers and the analysts is actually sitting. If we do that and we have these multimodal platforms, uh, we maybe uh, will need, uh, we will increase the accuracy of the correlated modalities and we maybe we will not need to have many uh, post-processing after. I mean, what I'm telling you now is what ideally I would like to have as a person running a facility and managing is to have a perfect platform that allow me to have all my modalities in one place. And in the long term, that will reduce probably the number of modalities that will be required to answer this particular question. Uh, of course, uh, to achieve that goal, I mean, there are people working, as you see, that we have different efforts for different repositories as Empire, IDR. We also have companies like Cytomine or uh, uh, Scalable Mines, or other companies that are also trying to work towards to deal with the big data and also multimodal data, not just only big, but multimodal. And with that, I would like to stop here and thank you for your attention and hopefully you have some questions. Okay, good. You can start. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting Roko and all the organizers. So I, so I talk about this um, with a topic of what is bioimage analysis. So it's often that we talk about how do we do bioimage analysis, but uh, um, so we usually don't really talk about what we're doing. So. Uh, so um, and as an introduction to this uh, whole defragmentation school, I think um, it's kind of a uh, general aspects that I try to talk about today. So this is an image from Robert Hooke in 1665, uh, the first drawing 
based on microscope image lasting, the imaging started from there, right? And then uh, there was a long time of drawings, and then uh, eventually, it's just 20 years that we started to capture things digitally and then do computations. Okay, so um, uh, this image analysis is um, in imaging. Um, many people say that um, image analysis is pretty difficult. Um, you do experiments, you get images, and then you try to do something out of it and then get results. But then this part is pretty much a bottleneck. And then, uh, so this was a survey in 2015 that we did together with other colleagues. So uh, we asked, so one of the questions was, which step in imaging-based research projects is the most difficult for you? And then, uh, so there were three options um, that you can choose. So one was experiment, one was image analysis, and one was microscopy. There many people say image analysis. So based on this survey, we made a, <laughs> um, how to say, so this is the reason that we need network. And then uh, we, we got funded and then uh, started doing this networking. Um, so let's think about why it's difficult. I mean, so by thinking about why it's difficult, it actually gives you, gives us many um how to say understanding about what we're doing though. so so this is my opinion right so the reason of difficulty number one so uh this is because of um um we probably love images too much for lab or it's too instinct i mean um intuitive in a sense, because we see image and we feel like we understand everything. So that's the way our life uh, goes, right? So that uh, we see such an image and then feel like um, we see many things. And then uh, um, the first thing is that the beauty of these patterns and structures that you find out, and then you're overwhelmed with visual recognition and then you forget about the fact that uh, we're doing science. Um, but from the point of view these days, so this is a drawing from uh, 19th century, but still we can see this as a um, classic way of doing image segmentation. You try to draw cells, but of course, so um, I mean, there is no boundary. Uh, in fact, everything is connected. Uh, but we try to see the boundary and then boundary that actually more or less um, um, interferes with the diffusion of molecules, uh, which eventually leads to the system. And then uh, so these boundaries that we try to draw is in fact segmentation, but we're doing this in a more digital way using numbers uh, that are actually measured using microscopes. And then uh, all we do in, in a sense is that there's an image and then that in fact our table or matrix of numbers. And then we try to reduce that to certain representation of the situation that we're seeing. So there's a process of reducing the dimensionality or complexity of data. And then, uh, um, but of course, I mean, so what we're trying to do is this. So this is a reduction of dimensionality or complexity of nature in a sense. But then uh, we tend to um, stick to these images because of um, um, this tells you more of this. But science is always like this, that you have to filter and then reduce the number of complexity trying to understand what's going on. So that's the, um, the basic process of biomage analysis. Difficulty number two. So this is a uh, um, because uh, biomage analysis using computer is a newcomer, and then that we can see with the difference in uh, understanding of image analysis and biomage analysis. So uh, image analysis in computational science um, is has much longer um, history 
than image analysis that we use in life sciences. And uh, um, the, you can see that with, uh, um, if you try to get some stats from PubMed, for example, um, if you try to count the number of publications with image J, right? And then uh, you see that there's a lot of increase from 2005. Um, by the way, image A, um, started to be developed from 1997. And then the, the one that was implemented just for Mac, it's called the NIMH, this was for 1987. And then uh, GFP um, became to be used as a marker for gene expression from 1994. And then cool CCD for microscopy. So this is just my personal experience, but it's from the early 90s that we started using in uh, biology. Uh, the cool CC was actually um, initially invented for astronomy, and then uh, biologists immediately became, wow, this is really, really great with this uh, um, less noise. And then this is where this actually the um, digital image started to um, be more popular in biology. So before that, of course, we had CCD cameras and then we had uh, um, normal cameras and then there's a photo multipliers that we are using for imaging. But um, this was not really uh, convenient because the association between computer and capturing device was not really um, digital. It was a um, always this uh, AD conversion in between and then so on. But I guess so. Uh, um, it's only recent that we doing started. So we're a newcomer. And then uh, uh, because we are still new, um, there are a lot of problems with this handling of image data and also analysis. Um, but, um, so I wrote a paper last, uh, we, we published with Simon uh, in 2021 about um, how we deal with this old problem, image data handling analysis. So if you're interested in just try to look this up. And then, uh, um, but you know, the, the problem of this uh, scientific use of image data, um, this is not really, um, there's not really much solution yet. It's just that we're trying to say that this is an ethics or uh, something like this. But I think uh, in science, uh, it, it, there's always uh, a lot of uh, problem, uh, including crowds and manipulations and then uh, fake data and so on. So it's one category of such. Um, so that uh, just trying to make image data and analysis to be reproducible is it's probably what we can best do uh, with these situations. But in any case, um, so definition of image analysis, I come back to this the difference between image analysis and biomedical analysis. So definition of image analysis, computer, computational science, you can find in a textbook, uh, digital image processing by Gonzalez and Woods. So this is like really like a um, Bible of uh, computational image processing. And then in one part, you can find the definition, uh, which is quoted here. Image analysis is a process of discovering, identifying, and understanding patterns that are relevant to the performance of an image-based task. One of the principal goals of image analysis by computer is to endow a machine with the capability to approximate, in some sense, a similar capability in human beings. So what it's saying here is that image analysis um, you try to let computer to recognize world just like human beings, so that you want to mimic the human recognition, right? So that's image analysis. But so, so I was always feeling something is dif different uh, because what I wanted to do. So by the way, I, I my background is completely biology, and then uh, I was heavily using microscope even constructing a microscope and then also doing image processing. But on the other hand, I was culturing cells. But then, so what I felt, so this um, understanding of image analysis doesn't overlap with what I want to do with image analysis because um, of this. Uh, so uh, 
in biology, image analysis is a process of identifying spatial temporal distribution of biological components in images and measure their characteristics to study the underlying mechanisms in an unbiased way. So that um, while the image analysis and computer science trying to mimic human recognition, what I want to do, uh, what I have been wanting to do is that um, I want to get rid of human recognition. I want to capture the nature as uh, objective as possible. I mean, that's science, right? So that uh, there's some gap between the goal of image analysis and computational science, which is to mimic the human recognition, and goal of image analysis in biology, which is to avoid getting interfered by human recognition. So there are two different goals, right? So that uh, we have to be clear about what we're trying to do. Uh, in that sense, so that uh, because we use a lot of resources that was developed in computational science, we use a lot of tools from this image analysis algorithms uh, from computational science, but we have to be careful that there are different goals in these two different fields. And then we have to, um, you know, make difference clear that we are trying to do by image analysis not image analysis in computational science while using those tools. So we do not have to be bordered with similarity to the human recognition. We have more emphasis on objecti objectivity of quantitative measurements rather than how that computer-based recognition becomes in agreement with human recognition. Okay. So, um, so as a newcomer, yeah, so biomedical analysis is a new field in life sciences concerned with quantitative measurements of biological systems. The way to teach and learn is marginally established, yet people feel like it can be learned through image analysis and computational science. That's confusing, right? So that makes a lot of these problems are in fact, um, of, uh, um, especially when a professional computational scientist without knowledge of biology and professional biologists without much knowledge about computational science work together, they don't feel this difference in the goal of image analysis and then just collaborate and finish their project without knowing that um, the computer science respects the eye of biologists, but biologists in fact think that we are trying doing very objective measurements. And what bioimage analysis expert should do is that should stand in between and keep the integrity of science of those two fields. Okay, so so that's the difficulty number two. But then the difficulty number three. Why it's difficult? So uh, one reason is there a lot of software and it's a bit chaotic. So uh, I'm using this Lego analogy metaphor uh, here again, like who we are. Um, so that, uh, so everyone knows how, how Lego goes. I mean, if you buy a box of Lego, uh, so especially with a very complex one, like uh, Millennium Falcon or X-Wings, um, if there is no this little booklet that teaches you how to construct Millennium Falcon or X-Wing, it's difficult, right? If, if it's just a pieces of uh, all these blocks. And then uh, if you lose that um, booklet, the manual, instruction manual, um, you probably, it's, it's quite difficult to um, reach the final uh, complete Millennium Falcon. So um, this is like a, um, the similar situation where we are facing, I mean, um, especially when you start biomedical analysis and then you start looking for Google and then you download software and then image J is on, in your desktop, on your desktop. And then now you can, we feel like, uh, okay, so I can do image analysis, but it, you, you immediately face difficulties. So one of the, pro the reason that I found out through many of this uh, talking with uh, people is that um, the there are some categories of software 
and in the major analysis especially. So that um, so I make three different categories of software. So one is a collection, and then one is component, and the other is workflow. So collection is like a image J or Python scikit image or a, such a library or software that just you download as a package. And inside that collection, there's a collection of components. So components, what I mean here is that, um, for example, like a Gaussian blur. So that's a one uh, filter that does something and then that's a component or it could be a connected component analysis. That's another component. And those different components are packaged together. And I think image J has like 500 different menu items and Fiji has about 1000. And those are the component that you can use, components that you can use. And then uh, what you need to do, but so if you download it, just a bag of this component, I don't know what you have to do then is that you have to create a workflow um, that actually combine this component in different steps like this. So this is a very linear, so it should be quite simple workflow, but you start with the image data that you capture and then step by step, you apply those components and eventually you come up with some numbers or plots or stats or visualizations. So, this process of assembling workflow, designing workflow, so this is a difficult part. Huh? But uh, because when you download this software, image or anything, so it's just a bag of Lego blocks. And then the instruction manual, in case of Lego, you have so that you can assemble them step by step. But in case of biological image data, it's not like that. You have to really think and then so what goes here and then what goes there. So knowing the details of what components doing, especially if you want to do it, do this in a scientifically sound manner, then you have to really know what components doing in terms of numbers, right? So this is the difficult part uh, that actually gives you the the um, um, challenges in biomedical analysis. So. Um, what I wanted to tell you here is that generally everything is called software, but there are subcategories and then don't mix them up is uh, it's kind of too crude. And then it's been very quite helpful teaching people when I try to explain this first. Okay, so this is the, um, the definition. Um, so I, I already explained so that I don't go with components and workflow. But um, there's a workflow template. So that's kind of a, so workflow is um, um, it's just, it's components assembled in a specific order to process image data and you, so to give some numerical parameters relevant to the studies of biological system. And then in many cases, these workflows are only in papers. They don't publish this as a tool. So that means that um, workflow is tightly associated with specific biological problem so that you don't really reuse it. Yeah. So, uh, but this is the, essentially what bioimage analysis are doing is to um, help constructing workflow together with biologists and microscope people to solve some problem. But there are workflow templates that a bit more general form of workflow yeah, so that offers us to tune algorithm parameters or swap some of the components like TrackMate. So these days, TrackMate is even getting more flexible. And then that's a very good example of this workflow templates. So collections. So uh, there's a package of building components with an interface or API to use them or construct workflows, software, libraries, image, MATLAB, Python, blah, 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 right? Um, so the difficulty of this software problem is that um, once you have uh, software, yeah, so uh, many um, naive people just think that you can do it because software is there. And then uh, more you do, you, the people believe that more you do, you get better. Because people has a lot of experience with the games, right? The gaming software. And then, uh, so the games you do a lot, yeah. And then you get better and you finally reach the final goal and then uh, you see the, uh, the, the, the boss uh, of the enemy. And then if you beat that boss, 
you don't, right? But in case of this uh, um, image analysis, every attempt to use those software, I mean, the goal is different because it's science. Research should have original some answer, and then using that software leads you to something new, which means that you have to <laughs> think and become creative uh, in doing that because it's science, right? So there's a difference between game and uh, biomedical analysis software, but um, it tends to be that um, having a good connection solves you everything, but it's not. Uh, so, um, with those difficulties, how can we solve problems? So, so, at, uh, um, so I basically started putting in uh, this order, but uh, I think it's better to start with biological problems, uh, which is essentially it's more important. So I'm taking an example. Yeah. So I think it's not the details about uh, this biological phenomena is important. Uh, it's important, but uh, for the, today's talk, I want to talk about um, how this problem was solved uh, by different group of people. And then we kind of compare these uh, different type of solutions. So that uh, um, the biological problem is this. So there's a localization of genes at their at the expression level. So this is a nucleus and then NPC. So this is a, a nuclear envelope. And then there are pore complexes embedded in envelope. And then there's a nuclear lamina that analyze this uh, envelope. And then there's a nucleolus, there's a lot of genes, right? Like this, you know? And then uh, there's a single chromosomes uh, that are somehow, um, some of them are located towards the core, the center of the, um, the spherical structure of nucleus. And some of them are attached to the periphery. And then it's known that if these chromosomes are close to lamina, the gene expression is suppressed. But there are some evidences that nuclear core complexes activate gene expression. So there's an activation and a suppression in both hands if chromosome is somehow attached near to the um, periphery of the nucleus. So that, uh, um, looking at where genes are located in 3D with the nucleus was very important. Right? So that, uh, um, for this, of course, Segmentation of the nucleus is important. So this is a very um, um, casual, easy segmentation using image resolution. But of course, there are many great tools and many different algorithms for nuclear segmentation these days. Um, so how do we do biomedical analysis now? Right. So that uh, um, we're taking that. Okay, we we now have equipped with excellent nuclear segmentation tools, and then how we do it. So that's kind of um, um, the post-processing analysis because now we have the good structure. Okay, so method one. So fish is this gene. Huh? So this fish reveals the location of gene full size. And then uh, within this nucleus, 3D, yeah, we try to find those uh, gene full size and then uh, um, locate where it is. So this kind of initial attempt was that um, you create three different zones. So there's a periphery, middle, and core. And then volume-wise, um, the existence of genes becomes equal uh, probability uh, with these three different zones. So the volume is same in these three different zones. And then locating the gene foci, so different gene foci, so these are different genes. And then, uh, so this one is, very much in the periphery and so on like this. And then you argue that, okay, so this gene is suppressed or activated because this gene is towards the periphery and so on. So this was kind of a um, shocking approach because of, uh, you can do statistics and then mark it with a T value, <laughs> um, um, student T value and so on, right? So, that, uh, um, so I was kind of, uh, um, when I started involved in 2009 or something, this was a, you know, kind of established method. So uh, I kind of started. And then, uh, so, um, so what they did is that um, they defined the nuclear shape by um, 
is actually a nuclear pool complex. And then uh, from there, they started to uh, measure the distances almost manually. Yeah? So the MEFSO2, uh, so this is a bit more, um, um, in a sense, uh, elegant because of uh, um, they define some uh, um, distance, specific distance from the nuclear periphery, and then uh, measured uh, whether the sky is located in this periphery or not. So this was just a you know binary um, category of uh, um, where it's located, and then made so statistics. Right. Signals were considered to be present at nuclear envelope if localized within 0 0.25 micrometer. Right. When, but then, if you look at the details, they were um, detecting the nuclear edge using DAPI image. You know? And then, uh, based on DAPI, they segmented um, with uh, manual thresholding. And then uh, they made this kind of uh, profile. And then they, they define a place where it's uh, actually um, whatever the percentage of the total. Uh, um, intensity is located. Well, I mean, you see that um, these two groups are um, trying to uh, evaluate whether genes are suppressed or activated based on this measurement, but these two groups are doing completely different things, right, in terms of image analysis, if you see in detail. And then it's also that scoring those G locations by arbitrary distances with zones. I mean, uh, you cannot even um, um, discuss this group to the other group because you are using different categories. So that, uh, it's, it's rather that uh, it's more. Um, so when I started this uh, problem, I, I saw those two methods and then there should be more um, better measurements. And then uh, so what I used was a 3D distance map and then if you multiply 3D distance map by location of gene, you get uh, distance, right? Um, because the multiplication result is this is zero, one, and then one multiplied by distance would be distance. Right? Okay, so that in that way, so I could locate thousands of uh, nucleus, uh, nuclei, and then uh, get statistics. And the good thing about this is this becomes a probability distribution of these genes. So now we can do a proper statistics to compare different uh, distribution of genes and so on. So I thought this was a uh, um, uh, this was this is the way. Yeah. So uh, the the best methods. Uh, currently in 2010. Right? But then um, in three years, what happened is that uh, one of my friend Christoph Zimmer, so his group uh, published a paper uh, which is without segmentation. So that um, he used cylindrical coordinate to locate the position of the genes in this space because Christoph Zimmer. In fact, so he is now a very famous uh, image analysis expert in biology, but he came from astronomy. So he knew how to use those different kind of coordinates in such a special place. So he immediately employed that knowledge into this and it did excellent analysis on this gene distribution. I mean, uh, I really felt I'm lost, <laughs> right? So in any case, so what I wanted to tell you with this experience is that, um, so you see that uh, starting from these three zone categories and then ended up in uh, uh, measurement without segmentation. I mean, segmentation is very, in any case, um, it's rather uh, biased by human recognition because you are, you are kind of, a, uh, with your gut feeling, say that this uh, segmentation is okay. So that, uh, um, in any case, avoid mimicking human recognition is the best. Yeah, and then uh, so that's biomedical analysis. And so from these experiences, be critical. So don't try to just use the the other guy's methods, and then be careful, and then uh, study other methods, and then uh, from biological point of view. Uh, and then uh, 
using the advanced knowledge on handling of digital image data, you combine this and you come to some uh, better answer step by step and eventually come to a solution like Crystal, right? Okay, so uh, that's the kind of basics, but then how we actually do those things? And then, uh, so one thing that um, we saw is that we have to have a network of those expert of biomass analysis. And then uh, the reason is because of, um, so I tell you the short history of biomass analysis. So that the, in the 90s, we had these, uh, um, a lot of biological problems, but we only had very few options uh, of uh, um, image processing analysis software. So that we just try to use them as much as possible and come to a solution. But eventually with the developer's effort, um, there are more tools, right? And then uh, what happens is that you have to choose. And then eventually it became more complex because multi-step the image analysis became more complex, so that you have to make uh, several steps of decisions. So, um, the export of using those software resources comes to some solution, starting with biological problems using those software, and then uh, get some analysis results. So, that, uh, these are the bioimage analysts, what we are in Novias. And then, so those guys actually, background is diverse, you know. And then, uh, to make distinction with development and analysis. So this is a kind of figure. So I already explained about this workflow, uh, which is the assemble components. So but what biomedics do is that using the resources that are offered by developers, we construct workflow and then try to work with biologists and microscopists, starting with me data and get numbers. So uh, I often show this slide. So the difference between software developer or algorithm developer and image analysts. So that uh, if you go to um, um, so uh, knife shop in uh, um, Tokyo's fish market. Um, so I went there actually, and then you, I wanted to buy a good knife, right? but I you get really um, amazed that there's so many different types of knives, and then you don't know which one to buy actually. Yeah? But of course, I mean, if you're a professional sushi master, what happens is that he knows which knife should be there and then which step and so on. He can just immediately say, I want this, I want this for that purpose. So uh, sushi master chooses different type of knives on the way, starting from the whole tuna into a small chunk of such a fish. So he uh, uses different type of knives and different steps. So uh, this is really like, you know, um, of course, I mean, there are the, the bladesmith. Um, so he's the, the guy like him. So uh, he's professional in making each knife. So as sharp as possible and so on. But then, so, so this is like, you know, so the developer and software packages, they, they are like bladesmith who are creating all those knives. And then image analysts are like uh, guys who actually use them uh, at in different steps and combine them workflow to create the sushi come to a great result. Another way of viewing this difference between development and analysis is like this. So that the um, collection and components, those are handled and developed by or maintained by developers. And then uh, the workflow is in the hand of this image analyst who uses those uh, resources. And I think the, the, more, the one of the important thing about this difference is that the, the, the value they have. So developers, they tend to go for speed and quantity and generic means that more generic the component is, it's greater. Now, on the other hand, analysts, so uh, it's more about accuracy and then scientific adequacy, whether this is scientifically okay. Um, speed, in a sense, is less important sometimes. I mean, often. Uh, so that, uh, if it's more accurate, we can take to um, double the time uh, of this computation. And then it's also specific. So every problem has specific uh, type of uh, issues. And then we are solving every specific, specific issue using genetic tool. So that, those are kind of two different things. 
Um, so Novias is uh, um, the network does image analysis, and then uh, that's why we are doing this school today. Um, in any case, so at the uh, um, uh, so the time is up uh, almost. So at, uh, um, I'm trying to go quicker. So uh, um, we are making uh, um, organization of these tools. So that because it's there's a lot of different type of uh, um, tools, and then uh, with numbers. So that uh, if you try to search for certain tool, it's always becomes um, um, you get some result in Google, but this kind of structure is not there. So that uh, we wanted to maintain such a structure, and also that um, there's a lot of hidden workflows within papers. So for example, this paper had source code for image data, which is linked in zip file, which never <laughs> really appears um, in the Google, right? So that, uh, um, those things happen. And also that um, this is a very good workflow for some image segmentation in crowd cells, but this doesn't really appear uh, in a Google search uh, because it's not evaluated. So um, we want to have direct access to workflows and components related to a specific problem. So that the uh, list of software library is not usable and then Google search is too much. So reading paper might not be helpful, yeah. And then, uh, so uh, we better have uh, some time, um, some nice uh, so search engine. So that uh, we are also developing a uh, um, workflow components organized uh, index of those different tools. So you see that there's collection, collection, uh, collection and workflow, workflow, collection, and so on. So that uh, we categorize them into different types. Um, after I started making, well, what we recognize is that um, there's a lot of good things. So that this is a kind of schematic view of the web to itself. There are workflow uh, component, uh, workflows, and there are components. And then each of the workflows and uh, components are tagged with certain keywords that is tagged by analysts. And then um, those workflows would be linked to papers, biology papers, scripts, workflows, and high level functions. And then components are associated with computational concepts. So that the image processing in papers, documentation, APIs, and source codes. So that those are kind of two different things. Huh? So the workflow is for biology, components is for computational science. And then they are within this web tool. The good thing about this is that, um, so that uh, the, while well, the components is like uh, uses a lot of these computational terms, um, workflows are using mostly these uh, biological terms. So that, uh, and inside we can link component that is used by certain workflow so that uh, there's a kind of, we can even make a automatic link between those things. And then each of these uh, entity components are mainly tagged with computational science terms while the workflow is tagged with um, um, biological concepts. So uh, um, what, what this allows us is that biologists can search with biological terms and then flow into components, which is computational terms. So that uh, without knowing much about computational concepts can access comp computational resources. On the other hand, Computational scientists, they can go start with components, certain computational aspects, and then start to go to this biological terms, right? So, uh, so it's kind of a, you know, we're trying to solve the tower bubble problem, which is that, you know, the people with different languages start to build a building, but um, uh, people start to build a building, but they got uh, so the god got angry and then say that okay so you, you speak different languages and then the, the building uh, collapsed right so that um we are in this field of biomedic analysis where interdisciplinary domain it's purely interdisciplinary so that there are computational vocabularies like these there are biological vocabulary like this and then we are working together kind of feeling the difficulty in understanding what each other. So uh, um, the reason that this uh, b.eu, the web platform, solved this problem is like this. So the, um, we still see Apple, yeah? 
and then uh, the English guy would say this is apple, and then a Japanese guy you cannot probably read this, but we say lingo, yeah, and then because we are pointing at the same object, the these guys can understand that okay in Japanese like this and okay in English like this, right? But the problem is, yeah, the real problem is like this. So this is apple cider, yeah, and then. The English guy, I say, this is apple cider. But Japanese guy, we don't have apple cider in our culture. So, so what's this, right? So that, uh, to understand each other beyond those language barriers, the first thing you have to uh, overcome is that this conceptual uh, <laughs> difference. Uh, so if you don't have the concept, you cannot name it, right? So, but now, with this uh, um, architecture of component workflow, so uh, biologists and computational scientists, computational can, scientists can start to think with central mayor and then reach the FFT bandpass filter maybe. And then um, computational scientists start with FFT bandpass filter and then reaches some problem in our biology. So uh, with this organization, so that uh, we kind of uh, um, find out that turned out to be more than just an organization and then people with different vocabulary bars are working together to create new values. So that's what we're doing. And then we also introduced ontology. So this is about informatics terms, control vocabularies to organize the terms that we use. So uh, I go just quick because it's only 15 minutes. Um, so, so learning is important. So uh, more component, you know, better workflows. And then there are textbooks. Uh, so uh, we are publishing in 2016, 2020, and then another one coming in October. And then these are all about, mostly about workflows because there are a lot of books about components, algorithms, but there are not much books about this workflow. Uh, we're trying to make textbooks about this. So this school, so we named it defragmentation, right? So that uh, um, so defragmentation is because um, the biomedical analysis resources are getting more and more complex and advanced. So that uh, in fact, biomedical analysis needs three different types of uh, um, domain. So that one is biology and imaging, microscopy, and biological concepts and uh, problems. Other is computational science, and other is mathematics. And then in the cross section of these three domains, bioimage analysis exists, and that's what we're doing. And then uh, in the crossing between these two domains, such as biology, imaging, and computer science, there are data processing issues. And then there's uh, mathematics and computer science, there's uh, machine learning and models. And then in between biology and mathematics, there are models, I mean, hypothesis and statistics. So that the biomedical analysis should deal with everything. And that's why it's very <laughs> busy and also uh, many different types of exercises there. And then each of these domains are getting more and more advanced. And then uh, we are kind of getting really fragmented with different types of skills. So that the uh, differentiation is how can we, within this complex advanced skills, how can we defragment all those skills and put it back to biomedical analysis? The goal is to measure biological systems. So that, uh, so when I see this uh, program, so uh, the intention of the Rocco and the organizers is that um, like this, so cloud and computing, GPU computing, workflow designing, workflow evaluation, it's benchmarking, machine learning. So, that, uh, so to me, it looks very much um, centers in this direction and somehow the other half is not there. So that, uh, it's still the fragmentation from my view is that half the way. Uh, but biomedical analysis itself is somehow heavy weighted these days uh, only on these parts and then somehow forgetting to do these things. So that, uh, I'm trying to push uh, <laughs> to reintroduce these things back into this because we have a lot of knowledge in here from biochemistry and also the traditional imaging uh, without segmentation. 
So we analyze a lot of temporal dynamics and spatial dynamics uh, in different ways, which we tend to forget with the way we'll create tools too much, maybe. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, a conclusion is that in biomedical analysis, your scientific and computational creativity matters. How to use computer software is only the beginning, and biology is a rich source of inspirations for analysts. Resources are there, and how you disc jockey those resources is the key to drive your uh, creativity. Thank you. And then uh, I tried to, so I thought this is a very good time to list all the people I interacted for environmental analysis, but I started and then I didn't have time to go all and then stop there. But I think another page is required. And then uh, I'm sorry if I forgot someone. I mean, I, 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 I didn't have time to go. I think another page is required for this. Thank you. Well, uh, after those encouraging words from Kota, <laughs> uh, let's take a little bit of a turn. And uh, so my name is Asta Mata. I'm the coordinator for image data services at Eurobioimaging. And uh, well, today I want to talk to you about the data services that we offer at Eurobioimaging. Also, what is Eurobioimaging? And some of the community efforts that we're working on towards providing image analysis as a service. All right. Up. Okay, so what is Eurobioimaging? Well, it's a research infrastructure. What do I mean by that? I do know if many of you are very familiar with it, so I'll just uh, um, say that it's basically a concept that the European Commission came up with. Uh, these are uh, varied in topics, so you have research infrastructures for getting basically access to instruments, uh, which could range from telescopes or uh, some uh, particle accelerators or so on, uh, to uh, biological things, uh, including imaging. So, European, so uh, Eurobioimaging is a European research infrastructure consortium uh, for open access to uh, biological and biomedical imaging, uh, as well as analysis technologies. And I'll come, I'll talk more about that later. Um, we are actually very distributed in nature. So all, all the countries that you see in green are the member states that form Eurobioimaging. And we have uh, currently over, uh, I think it's already over 149. So let's say uh, in that ballpark, uh, individual facilities that are part of Eurobioimaging. So these are um, facilities that could already be a part of a university or a research infrastructure uh, or, or, or some institute. But uh, at Eurobioimaging, they are basically coming together to provide access to external users. Um, so these pins are actually denoting that. Um, apart from the nodes that actually, we call them nodes, the facilities uh, that provide access to imaging instruments, uh, we also have uh, uh, what's called the coordinating hub, which is a small team of people that are managing access for these users um, when it comes to both instrumentation as well as analysis. And we sit in three different places. We sit in Turku in Finland with our Satway 3 seat. Uh, we also sit at uh, EMBL in Heidelberg uh, where we have a biology hub or also the data services. That's why I'm also sitting at Amble um, um, or in uh, Torino where our medical hub sits. So that's a, uh, that's a little uh, introduction into your bioimaging. Um, as a user, as a scientist, you can basically access more than uh, 50 technologies. Uh, I think it's even more by now, um, uh, different kinds of imaging technologies ranging from microscopy techniques to uh, medical imaging uh, technologies. Um, so that's the basic idea. Uh, of Eurobioimaging to offer open access and uh, uh, open access to instruments, yes. But I think the really key point here is with support of the uh, expert technical staff, because those are the people who are behind running these instruments and they know the real depths of how things work and most importantly, how things don't work. Uh, so that's why uh, when we uh, provide users access, it's not just the instrument, but it actually comes together with the experts um, uh, that know how to do those uh, use those technologies. So we are uh, very happy to work with all the staff at, uh, at our different facilities. We also provide image data services, and today I'm going to focus a bit on that, um, as well as we provide uh, training opportunities for um, in different forms, including to a certain degree uh, this uh, course uh, as well. So uh, when it comes to the technologies, uh, well, the range is huge. Uh, I alluded to that earlier. It goes from very small molecular sort of uh, uh, imaging technologies all the way to human imaging, preclinical imaging, and so on. 
Um, how actually to access this? Uh, well, we have a we have a very uh, simple way. So as a user, you can um, you can apply through our web portal. Um, and uh, uh, if your project has not gone through um, a process of scientific review, then that's also also a possibility. However, if you've already gone through scientific review, you can fast track into the technical feasibility at our nodes, whether it's uh, uh, possible for them to carry out your project or not. And voila, we put you in touch with the nodes. You can go there. We, uh, you can also actually uh, travel to these places. And sometimes we're even uh, having some grants to support this uh, um, this travel as well as carrying out of your experiments. Uh, here I will also point out that uh, we are currently uh, having uh, able to offer image analysis as a service too. Okay, so uh, now I wanted to get a little bit more into the data aspect of it. And uh, I mean, I guess it's uh, not uh, very surprising for this particular audience, but there are certain peculiarities when it comes to uh, imaging data, especially when we talk about uh, cloud computing and using image data in the cloud. And um, well, one thing is also just that the sheer size of the images, it's actually pretty large. You wouldn't be surprised if I tell any of you that single experiments go from multiple gigabytes to, I don't know, terabytes of, uh, of space. Um, then uh, this is just a little um, uh, thing that I, I pulled out of image data repositories, one of, which is one of the open image data repositories for um, for keeping specialized for keeping uh, image data, and they they contain 104 studies, which make up to 307 terabytes. That's already giving you a bit of an idea of how much uh, this data can be. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have a diversity of formats. So in general, uh, with the diversity of instruments, there's also a lot of formats that people need to deal with when it comes to analysis. Um, and uh, in addition to just the format, you also have a uh, format or at least the information or the uh, metadata that is important for you to understand and have a look at before you're even able to do uh, any uh, downstream analysis. So those things are also a bit of a challenge to, to uh, get, right? Um, as well as, uh, well, with the latest technology, you always have increasing complexity of the imaging data uh, with the multimodal technologies and specifically the correlative data sets where you're working with different modalities of imaging at the same time. Uh, these methods are, uh, of analysis are becoming more and more challenging. Uh, well, in addition to that, uh, I don't know if this uh, crowd has already been introduced to the FAIR concept, but that's why I, I actually put it because, uh, well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make uh, image data a resource, a global resource that people uh, can actually use, trust, uh, and reuse. <laughs> So that's why we want to make sure that the image data that our users are producing is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, so this goes both for data um, as well as analysis methods. And at Eurobioimaging, we are trying to support people, uh, whether it's directly the users or uh, the staff or uh, that is working at the facilities to be able to work such that the data that is produced is both uh, data as well as analysis is both uh, is fair and open. Um, so there are two things that we uh, that I will tell you a little bit more about. So first is uh, how we help directly a user. So this is where our um, expert image analysts come in. So as of now, uh, Eurobio Imaging is able to offer image analysis as a service. So you as a user can actually approach us and uh, you will be able to access, uh, uh, let's say, request uh, uh, image analysis as a service on your own data set. You could have acquired it completely at a different place, uh, but our expert image analysts at any of these uh, facilities uh, that are cu currently taking part in the proof of concept study for, for this particular technology will be able to help you. Um, well, the kind of technologies they offer, well, of course, they are experts in a lot of uh, um, open source software, whether it's like Fiji, they, they can help you with image analysis with Python. Um, and of course, a lot of them are actually really little Noibia. So we have a lot of Noibia folks uh, who are actually uh, at uh, working at the node at these uh, specialist image analysts to help people uh, with, uh, with their image analysis needs. Um, some of our nodes are actually uh, offering these services for uh, medical imaging as well. So it really depends on your question. And uh, if we're able to help you, we will be more than happy to. 
And the reason I bring it up actually in this crowd is, which was kind of the reason why Roko was also proposing that uh, maybe it's a good idea to talk to these people, uh, to you people about it, is um, uh, that this is actually one way that we want to also uh, bring forward the importance of image analysis uh, by providing uh, external projects to these uh, to uh, our expert image analysts. Uh, this will hopefully uh, help them get visibility as well as uh, some funding opportunities because European imaging can also uh, support some uh, specific topics of uh, analysis uh, through funding support as well. So this is what we are looking at right now. And we are uh, very excited to start supporting people with image analysis, uh, providing image analysis as a service. Um, so these, uh, let's say, uh, services are mostly directed to uh, individuals. I mean, apart from the fact that our node personnel are also involved in maintaining some of these uh, open tools uh, uh, and libraries, which is quite important in general. Uh, but uh, this is, they are also happy to help a single user go ahead with their analysis uh, uh, needs. Uh, but uh, at the coordinating hub, we are also trying to do certain things which are helpful for the community in general. So this is basically the services that, let's say, at the hub or where we sit. Uh, first of all, we actually uh, participate in a lot of uh, European uh, projects, uh, EOST Life, which uh, uh, supports this uh, particular course is one of them. Uh, but there are many other projects that we are part of, which could be specific for either a particular, uh, like either COVID-19 in case of by COVID or just for health data sets in case of healthy cloud. So we were just trying to get visibility also for image data in the European research landscape, which we find quite important because not all data is uh, sequencing and genomics data, right? Um, and uh, we also support open uh, data repository, image data repositories, specifically the bioimage archive or the IDR and Empire specifically for uh, electron microscopy images. So we actually help our users. So we have in our team, we have data steward who is working on helping people put their data in a certain format so that it's easy for them to submit eventually to one of these open data repositories. So we're also help, happy to help uh, users with that process. Um, well, uh, what's also interesting is that uh, I, I talked about some challenges with the with image data, but everybody is also working towards, uh, you know, solving these challenges, let's say, or overcoming these challenges. And one important part of that is to coordinate the efforts that are going on in the community. So that's another thing that uh, we do. We actually work with a lot of community-driven initiatives, whether people are talking about how to uh, put the metadata right or how to uh, work on a particular file format. So these are the kind of things that we are also uh, working. Um, and we are also providing some sort of a soft support. So we have expert groups where people can uh, drop in and discuss about uh, what are the problems they face when it really comes to offering image analysis as a service. Because, oh, well, it's not particularly streamlined right now, but it's an exciting place where we all find ourselves currently. So yeah, these are exciting times to, to be working on, on image analysis, I must admit. Okay, uh, well, there are a couple of examples that I've uh, pulled out. So uh, a few things I want to remark. First is the importance of the open image data repository. So uh, this is basically the bioimage archive. It's, a, it's an archive for image, uh, specifically for image data that is held at Anvil EBI. Um, the basic idea is that they welcome all kinds of images uh, that are related to a publication. Um, and uh, this will basically help uh, everything from reproducibility of the results, uh, as well as uh, having some sort of reference data sets that you can always look up. Like, I wonder what a classical HeLa cell looks like. So, you know, those kind of data sets should also be there. So reference data sets. Um, but also keeping in mind that there's a potential once all this data is openly available for either new research based on this open data or potential reuse. And again, this is probably the audience that might uh, understand this more that uh, if the data is openly available, it opens uh, doors for potential uh, further research, whether it's developing different algorithms uh, for image analysis and so on. So, you know, the, the possibilities are endless potentially if we have enough of this data. Uh, 
Uh, the bioimage archive is actually uh, made in a particular uh, architecture, so you, uh, it's made in such a way that there can be added value databases uh, on top of it. And two examples of that is actually the IDR and Empire, which could still have at the basis uh, uh, the bioimage archive to store the data, but have an extra layer of informative layer, whether of metadata or maybe displaying data in a particular fashion um, and serving a particular uh, subset uh, of interest, for example, Empire for for electron microscopy data sets. Um, the other thing that uh, what we are trying to do to basically encourage people to use this, and this is again, uh, this work supported by a couple of the EC projects uh, that we have at your bioimaging is to really go through this pipeline of getting image data, uh, putting that in a standardized file format, and uh, maybe be able to do some cloud compatible image analysis, um, and uh, then be able to submit it to, uh, um, in our case, bioimage archive. So um, here, the currently, uh, the work that's going on in our team is also uh, supporting the open microscopy environment team in further development of czar based file formats, which are very useful for uh, computing in the cloud. And I guess you probably will hear more about that in the next days. So yeah, and um, I think you probably, I don't know if Bura is going to be able to join, but uh, he definitely has helped uh, in preparing some, some materials for this course, um, as well as uh, some work that has been done uh, previously uh, already as a part of the EOS Life project where uh, there was uh, some proof of concept image analysis uh, pipeline. And I guess you'll hear about that from Beatrice and uh, Bjorn in the, uh, in a couple of uh, next days or like next sessions of this course too. Um, now the idea for us is to make a very modular pipeline and uh, it's sponsored by these different uh, projects that we're involved in and this will actually be made as a Galaxy pipeline um, and made available to the users. So in a way what we are trying to do here is to make a tool that is uh, potentially useful for the whole community. So we are not uh, targeting a single user, but we are really trying to uh, patch uh, whatever we feel uh, currently is the is need from the community as we understand it. Um, well, uh, I will make a brief mention to another project that uh, we have uh, recently uh, started with and it's called AI for Life. Uh, here, the idea is to provide uh, artificial intelligence uh, services for life science imaging. Um, well, it is uh, basically based on a resource that already exists. It's called the Bioimage Model Zoo. Uh, you guys can have a look at it. It's a place where you store uh, pre-trained uh, uh, machine learning models. Uh, the idea is that you can actually go there, easy to access model, you can put your data, run it and uh, get a result, even try to compare different models and so on. Uh, during this project, during the lifetime of this AI for Life project, we'll try to make uh, bioimage models so more and more user friendly um, and uh, try to have more compute resources behind uh, functioning of this um, um, of this web client. So please uh, keep an eye out, use it. If you have any problems, let us know because we try to rectify those too. Uh, well, so yeah, that's just a bit of a wrap up. Uh, what we're trying to do at uh, Eurobioimaging is to help the users, I mean, well, uh, to basically make this uh, image data fair and open, again, supported by our EC projects so that once the data is in this, uh, in this domain, uh, it can actually be used to generate new uh, methods and new knowledge. Again, some of these proof of concept things are being done by different uh, uh, within the different EC projects. And uh, definitely what's very important is what our nodes contribution here is, which is basically trying to get users directly uh, to this new methods and knowledge, uh, maintaining a lot of these open image analysis tools, as well as uh, helping people uh, with their image analysis needs. So yeah, with that, uh, well, thank you very much. If you want to contact me, please feel free if you have any questions whatsoever. We always have our doors open and are very happy to, to you know, even have a chat. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to bring the little Swiss contribution here. You didn't see, see often the Swiss flag in the last presentation. So, um, but we still have access to some of these services offered by, by Europe, so uh like galaxy so we'll see galaxy also today um so yeah so i'm working at the at the microscopy imaging center at the university of Bern, and so essentially i'm i'm developing a lot of software for people um and uh, using jupiter almost uh, every day 
so um, I uh, and mostly I use it on my own laptop, but sometimes I also use some of the services that I will talk about today um, for demonstrations, for courses, um, and also to share uh, workflows with, with with other people. So when I was asked to give the course, I thought about what I would present. So I could have also focused on one specific tool uh, and um, uh, showing you all the details of, of one specific tool. But given that the course is not so long, I think it, it made more sense to give you an overview of all the possibilities there are to run uh, Jupyter uh, in the cloud. So you will see there are many uh, very different types. Uh, all of them have uh, advantages and also negative sides. And I think it's good for you to have an overview. I saw that most of you have experience in Fiji, but probably most not so much in Python or with Jupyter. So we'll also just briefly uh, explain what Jupyter uh, is. And so the, the, the practical part of the exercise is going to be more about accessing these services and see how they work uh, more than you know, running things in, in a notebook or writing code, right? So you're not supposed to know Python to, to follow. Okay. So yeah, the, I, I, I pasted the, the link to, to this presentation in, uh, in the chat, so you can access it there. Otherwise, you can just type bit.ly uh, defrag Jupyter, and it will bring you to this presentation. So there are a few links that might be helpful later on. So just summarize what notebooks uh, allow you to do. So classically, when you do image processing or any kind of data analysis, you would write a script right uh, in the language you want. It could be also in Fiji. And then you open a terminal or you open the, some command line tool and you execute your script. And this gives you at the end an output uh, folder full of outputs. It can be tables, like a CSV file. It can be images of segmentation. Uh, it can be also a plot uh, and analysis, right? Uh, but so when you are uh, developing your workflow, uh, this kind of approach is not very efficient, right? If you want now to change some parameter in your workflow, or adjust something, you have to rerun everything, wait until it's done, check the output, and, and do this over and over, right? So this is why in data-intensive fields, um, people have started using more and more these notebooks, and in particular, Jupyter notebooks. So Jupyter notebooks look, uh, look like this. So this is this page that you see here uh, in this part here. And it's essentially just a simple text file uh, formatted as a JSON. So it's a particular file, but you, you can open it in a text editor if you want, uh, which is rendered in the browser by Jupyter. Okay. And it consists of different parts. Uh, you can write and execute code. So we have these gray boxes that contain code that you can execute. Uh, you can also have rich displays, right? Uh, like images, like you see here on top. It can be also even interactive sometimes. Um, and you can also comment your code and not just put comments like you would put in a, in a, in a regular um, script uh, just with a hash or something like this, but you can actually uh, format your, your, your comments, right? And create an actual document with titles and links and uh, lists and whatever you want using this language called Markdown. So this is a markup language, a very simple language uh, uh, that allows you to format your text, for example, to create a title, you just uh, write a hash and then your title. To write in bold, you use stars. So it's kind of like a LaTeX, but uh, a thousand times simpler. This code, these notebooks, they execute step by step. And so this is really the important part, right? So when you design code, when you design a workflow, you want to do step by, things step by step. So you, for example, you do a threshold and you have to pick which method you use for thresholding. So you can try a few, look at the output, and then go on from there. Um, and so this is one of the main advantages of these of these notebooks, right? You can do things step by step and come back and restart and without executing the whole script all the time. Uh, these days, it, these notebooks are mostly used with Python. Uh, they were designed at the beginning to work with other languages. The name comes from this, right? The Ju Jupyter stands for Julia, Python, and R. Uh, but so these days, it's mostly used with Python. So you can use, with, uh, use it with other languages. But I would say that the majority of people use it with Python. You can also run other software in there uh, via, via different uh, mechanisms. One of them is, for example, PyImageJ, which is a, a, a little package that allows you to use uh, ImageJ or Fiji functions directly in your notebook. So there is a kind of an interaction that you can create between these two worlds. 
uh, and this is also true for other uh, other languages, right? You can also mix, for example, R and Python in a, in a single notebook. So it's a very rich environment. So there are many other details and things I'm not mentioning today for the sake of time, but it's a very interesting uh, interesting tool. So what are the main advantages? So as I mentioned, uh, the main advantage is uh, when you design a workflow that you you are very much more closer to your code than if you just execute. Uh, scripts yeah, you can do these things in a very iterative way and this is valid in other fields also right so these notebooks that are used in companies like bloomberg to do financial data analysis they are used in other research communities for example in geosciences there is this pangeo um, uh, project uh, because they deal with similar issues as we did right with large sizes of data and uh, computationally intensive uh, tasks and you see the jupiter hub Jupiter here is in the center of this uh, uh, project that they, that they have. So it's used in many other places. So even if you stop doing bioimage analysis or research, uh, learning how to use these kind of tools will be, uh, will be useful. It's very useful to do uh, the code documentation and um, for workflows, for papers, uh, or anything where you use code, and for reproducibility. Right, so you, thanks to these uh, mix of output, code, and commenting, you can really be very efficient at explaining what you are doing. Right, so instead of publishing a paper and putting a script on GitHub and saying this is how we did it, you can actually explain to people step by step how you actually did it. Right, and then people can reuse it, maybe fix errors, uh, but at least it will be a bit more reproducible than than the simple uh, file that you're supposed to execute. So as an example, I'm using uh, these notebooks, for example, to document uh, packages that I write. So I wrote a small package called Microfilm to um, uh, make images of um, uh, multi-channel uh, data. And so I have wrote some tutorials and some documentation in these notebooks. And there is a tool called Jupyter Book that allows you to transform, to transform a series of notebooks into a little website, right? And then you can use GitHub to publish this. But essentially, uh, you can use these notebooks for documentation in a very efficient way. The big advantage is compared to writing documentation in an abstract way, where you're not sure that your code actually executes. Here, the notebook has to execute properly uh, for the, the output to be there, right? So you're sure that what you tell users uh, to do at, at least here works. And when they copy paste your command, it will actually work. So it's a very efficient way of writing, uh, writing documentation. And finally, and this is the topic of today, it's a very efficient way of exploiting uh, cloud resources. And the reason for this is because of the mechanism of, uh, of how Jupyter works. So your notebook displays in the browser, right? You only need a browser. You don't need an application to install. So anytime you have access to a browser, including on your phone or anywhere, you can access uh, Jupyter. And uh, the actual calculation is done somewhere else. It's done on a server. So Jupyter has a server, a Jupyter server. And on the server, you have a kernel that runs. The, the kernel is essentially the basic thing that runs your code, right? And it can be Python, can be R, can be also other languages. But this is the important thing that it runs somewhere else. So sometimes it runs on your own computer, but it can also run somewhere else. And you essentially send from your browser, you send information on what computation you want to do. The computation is done, and then it's sent back to your browser as an output if you, if you want it. But the data are not necessarily stored inside your, uh, your, uh, your browser, right? So the only limitation of this is if you really want to look at a, at a gigantic image, it might take some time to send it back to the browser. So essentially, you can run this server and this kernel anywhere you want, as long as you can connect it uh, connect to it via internet, right? Via your browser. So it can be on your laptop. This is how you use it uh, um, most of the time, I would say. You can run it in the cloud. Uh, this is what we are going to look at today. And you can also run it on um, a cluster, for example, right? If you, your university has a cluster, in principle, you can install there Jupyter and then exploit all the resources of your cluster uh, on this um, um, via Jupyter, which makes it much easier than um, running this uh, Slurm scripts or whatever that normally you have to do, right? So you just need a bit of collaboration from the people uh, managing these clusters, which is not always easy. But if you find uh, some people who uh, are ready to help you, it's a great way to use uh, to use a cluster. 
Okay, so in the end, so the user where it runs doesn't affect the interface. So you will see we we'll run Jupyter in many different places. It will always look the same way, right? So this is also kind of an advantage. You're never lost because oh, suddenly the interface is different or you, you, you have to relearn something, something new. Okay, so why run Jupyter in the cloud at all and not just on your laptop? So one of the main reasons is that it allows you to try new software without affecting your computer at all. Right? So it's even more isolation than with things like Conda. So maybe you heard about these environments that you can create on your computer. So essentially creating little spaces on your computer where you install specific um, packages for each of your projects. So here you can really start in the cloud uh, some uh, Jupyter instance or use a Jupyter instance, install a bunch of uh, software. And whenever it breaks for, for any kind of reason, you can just suppress the project and we'll start from scratch, right? If you start having this kind of issues where you cannot install things anymore on your computer, it can become really complicated to uninstall the right things. So if you just want to try things out, this is a really a good solution. You will have access to your projects from anywhere, right? Especially in these days where we um, do a lot of remote work and I think in the future we'll do more and more. Um, so you can start somewhere on uh, some computer doing some work, go home and uh, connect from your home to the same uh, resource and continue there your work, right? So your notebooks, your data will be still in, in place and so you will be able to continue working. Uh, you, this gives you access to a wide range of different uh, hardware, right? Especially if you need GPUs for the infamous deep learning apparently, uh, or if you need a lot of RAM because if you have a huge data set, uh, this is an easy way to get access to these kind of resources, right? So you don't need a desktop from a facility somewhere uh, that has a really good GPU. You can, in principle, if you get right access, do that over the cloud. Uh, it's also a great way to share uh, things. So you can create demonstrations or for papers, and people can then run them interactively. So people can, depending on the mechanism, people can copy your project and rerun it or they can get access to whatever you did uh, and it's not just a static thing that people uh, read like on github uh, it's really a thing that people can then run themselves check modify uh, reuse uh, give you feedback etc etc so this this is valid for a code of articles there are more and more places where you can actually publish these kind of things like eLife for example um, it's a great way also to do courses. So sometimes I use some of these resources to create courses uh, to avoid having people have to install anything on their own computer uh, for software documentation, as you have seen just before. And to use these resources, what you will need uh, are the following things. So you will need a running instance of Jupyter. So we'll see different ways of how you can access, access this. So it needs to be running on the cluster or on the cloud that you want to use. You will need the necessary software to run your script. So I, you, maybe you do some segmentation with Stardist or, or, or Cellpose. So you need to be able to install these packages wherever you are connecting. You need to act to the right uh, hardware, right? So depending on the services you use, there might be some limitations, so we'll see that. And in the end, this is, I think, a, quite a crucial point. Uh, you need access to the data. Right? And I think this is probably still a bit the limiting factor in all these kind of um, online tools. Uh, for the day-to-day -day work is the necessity to have the data close to uh, uh, where computation happens. And when I say close, it's not like physically close, it's just close in terms of how fast can you access the data. Right? If every time you uh, need to do analysis, you have to upload uh, 200 gigabytes of data from your acquisition of the day, uh, people tend to never do that. Uh, because it's slow, because you have maybe limited space where you need to upload it. So this is, for me, probably still one of the main limitations. And we saw it also a bit in, in the previous presentation that there are difficulties in creating these full workflows where everything is included. Uh, because handling data and in imaging, we know all know that this can be complicated when you have very large data sets. Uh, so this is a, a bit of a limitation. Yeah, I didn't say this uh, at the beginning of the presentation, but so I will just present these tools and then we will explore a few practically uh, together in the, during the exercises. So there are many flavors of notebooks, uh, Jupyter uh, on the cloud. So I will just make a list and we'll focus on a few, but I just want still to go uh, in uh, quickly through all the, the, the possibilities. 
So one that you probably know or have heard of is Google Colab. Uh, so this is the own version of Jupyter from Google Colab that gives you access to uh, GPUs, for example. Um, then you have the actual cloud. This is what uh, I would say IT people would call the, the real cloud, right? So it's uh, big companies like Amazon and uh, Google that provide to you uh, um, uh, computing resources in the cloud uh, in a very uh, bare way, right? So it, you, you get access to computers and then you have to do everything yourself. So there are big players, there are also smaller players. So in Switzerland, we have, for example, switch engines. Uh, which uh, works out with academia, which provides the same kind of services, cheaper and probably a bit more uh, friendly and accessible. And then you have other services like Amazon SageMaker that we just mentioned after that. Then you have dedicated resources. So these, these main cloud resources, they are meant to, to do anything, right? Any company can access these cloud resources and run anything on there. It's not dedicated to Jupyter. So you have to do some effort to use them. But there are some companies running services that specifically run Jupyter Notebooks. And so I will just uh, show you an example with Paperspace. And finally, we have like public uh, resources that are for free uh, mostly and that you can access uh, with an account. And so this is where, what we will focus on today, uh, in particular on this Galaxy project that was mentioned before, which is a new project, and on this Binder uh, project they fulfill very different uh, tasks. And so I think it's a, it's a good example in the exercises we can test these two out. But I will uh, talk a bit more in detail about these three towards the, the, end, of the, the end of the presentation. Okay, so first let's look at, remember what Colab is. So you see here a typical Colab notebook. You see it looks very much like a Jupyter Lab, a Jupyter notebook. Uh, they just changed a bit the, the UI. The main advantage is that it runs on Google infrastructure and you get access to GPUs for free. Uh, so if you don't have a big GPU and a computer and you're uh, where you're working, this is a, a kind of a good solution. It's really terrific to making demos and courses, especially if you do courses about deep learning or machine learning. Um, getting access to, I don't know, 30 students to a GPU in, at a university uh, is almost an impossible task, at least in the smaller university like, uh, like Bern. So having access to, to uh, Google Colab is really uh, nice. And um, the data storage is provided by Google Drive, right? So if you pay a bit for storage, it's um, quite unlimited, I would say. The disadvantages of this, uh, of uh, Google Colab, is that there is no really way to adjust resources. So you cannot set how much RAM or how many CPUs you want access to. So you get something uh, assigned. So depending on what you're doing, this can be a problem. So I've seen people online complaining that uh, their software wouldn't run because it ran out of RAM. There is no guarantee of service. So this is one thing that I keep repeating to people who tell me how Google Colab is uh, fantastic. Nothing forbids Google next year to say we shut down the, the service or suddenly it becomes uh, incredibly expensive to, 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 to run, right? And Microsoft did that with their own version of notebooks. Uh, someday they said we, we shut it down. And so if you were using that service, you had to find something else. So I would recommend not putting all your eggs in the same basket and uh, still use other services to make sure you always have access to, to something. They have their own version of Jupyter, as you see here. Um, so the risk is also that uh, some features are breaking. At some point, some widgets, some interactive widgets were not working anymore in Colab. So if you had your whole notebook based on this, uh, it didn't work anymore. And there, it's not an open source community, right? So you cannot say, uh, file an issue and say, hey, please fix this. So you just have to hope they fix it. And the, the last thing, which is quite a problem, is the fact that the environment that is provided by Google is uh, somehow frozen. They, they pick the Python version, which is installed, and you can really not change these things. So depending what you need to install on a Google Colab to run your experiments, your, your analysis, you, this might really be, uh, really be a, a, an issue, right? So there's no way to create your own environment. Okay, so if you want to explore this, I really highly recommend to explore it via, especially for microscopy, this project called Zero Cost Deep Learning for Microscopy from the Enriquez lab. Uh, so they provide a series of notebooks uh, that uh, walk you step-by-step to how to do uh, deep learning for microscopy uh, for different tasks. And so they have a really long series of notebooks that you can run. So even if you don't know Python or any coding, it will be easy to just go through the, through the whole routine. So, I uh, really encourage you to, to look at this if you want to explore. 
Okay, so the next one is the, the actual cloud. Uh, so this will be quite brief. So when you uh, rent a machine on the cloud, it comes as an empty machine, right? Uh, it comes with an OS. Usually you, it's Linux because it, this is how the cloud mostly works uh, these days is using uh, some version of Linux. And then you have to install everything on this, right? You will have to install Jupyter. You have to install Conda, make sure that everything runs, uh, add storage to your, uh, to your machine, making sure that everything works together, making sure you can access to it remotely. So this can be quite complicated. The big advantage of this solution, if you have some people to help you, maybe, is that it's very, very flexible in terms of the resources that you can get access to, right? So this is an example from this switch uh, solution that I sometimes use. And so these are the different machines that you can rent. So you can have tiny machines with 500 megabytes of, uh, of memory, or you can have another machine with 64 gigabytes of, of, of memory, right? And you can use them for a day, two days, shut them down, close them down. So it's a very flexible way of doing things, but it requires some, some IT knowledge, right? So the real cloud is uh, probably not the most recommended thing. So it can be really complex to set up and maintain. Uh, you're also responsible for the safety and the maintenance of, the, of, of the, this instance that is running. So to tell you an anecdote, I was giving once a course and I was running my Jupyter Hub to give access to Jupyter to students uh, on Google. So I rented the computer at, at Google and suddenly everything shut down and I, during the course, and I received an email from Google telling me that they shut it down because somebody was mining Bitcoin on my instance, okay? So somehow somebody got access to my instance and was using it to uh, mine Bitcoin. Uh, so this is the kind of things when you are not an IT person and I'm not an IT person that can be really complicated to deal with. And the last thing, it can be difficult to a uh, project costs, right? So these machine run and you pay the bill by minute or whatever, and you have to pay for very different things, for storage, for RAM, for, for usage, for even the communication, for the IP address. So it can be quite uh, complex to, to handle. Okay, so now the, the last, um, the last uh, set of services. So all these services, they use a technology called uh, containers to basically allow you to run whatever you want to run and run it in a reproducible way. So we just quickly explain what this uh, container technology is uh, without detail, uh, and then see how it's used in these different, uh, different services with a, few, with a few examples. Okay, and so these containers, they are provided by this Docker, Docker uh, uh, software. So this is your cloud and you have these uh, computational resources inside your cloud. Right? And then somebody comes and says, I want to use your cloud. So the easiest thing you could imagine is to give that entire cloud to that person and treat uh, this cloud as one big computer. Okay? Then that person starts installing things in there. They, they use scikit image of a specific version. They are happy. But then comes the next person and says, oh, I also want to use the cloud and I want to use another version of scikit image. And now you have two problems. They, these people are going to fight for the resources. So how do you share all these CPUs when they are using the same machine? And also, how do you deal with the conflicts of the things which are installed in this, in, this, in this machine? And the solution to this is to basically give a small computer inside that uh, big computer uh, to each person, right? So the first person gets a computer with two CPUs here, and uh, that person can install whatever, whatever she wants. Same thing with the second one, same thing with the third one, just have to make sure you have enough resources in your cloud or put some limits on how many people can access. But this is the way these clouds are usually used uh, in the kind of services we're going to see is that you basically limit, uh, you create a small container where people can run their things, right? And it's actually called containers and it's called containers, I guess, for two reasons. The first one is that they are completely isolated from each other, uh, like these containers, right? So what happens in a container stays in the container. Uh, so you're not affecting anything uh, from your neighbor when you're doing something in your container. And the second thing is that the container contains everything that is needed to run whatever you want to, do, uh, to, to run, okay? So these containers, again, they are run by this Docker software and Docker provides uh, an isolated space where software can run without affecting the rest of the computer. So it runs its own OS. So you can install Docker on your own computer if you want. So I can install Docker on my Mac and run Linux on inside this container. So it's completely independent. 
You can install any software. So in our case, we would run Jupyter and packages, maybe Conda. You can access to data outside uh, the container. So you can make a link to outside. So you can still access data on your own computer or in the cloud or anywhere else. You can still communicate with the inside of the, of the container from outside. So if you have a Jupyter server you, running inside the container, you can access to it. You have just to open the right uh, path to communicate with it. And the last thing is that once you have a container, you can essentially make a snapshot of it and upload it uh, to some uh, repository and reuse it later. Okay? And there are some basic containers that you can, people reuse all the time. And then you can adjust these containers. So I can use somebody else's container and then add whatever I think is missing in this container, create a new container and upload it, right? So there are multiple layers inside these containers uh, to create whatever you need to, to, to run your analyzer. So these are usually summarized in these Docker files. So these Docker files say, give all the commands necessary to install the necessary software in your, in your container. And you use what is called the base image. So this is just an image that contains all basic software. And then on top of that, you can install what you want. So you just have to be a bit familiar with Linux to write these things. Usually we don't want to put our hands into these files. This is just to show you how it works. Uh, but the, the services we're going to look at, there are essentially an interface for us between this rather complex Docker software and, and us, right? So they will facilitate our life to use these services. Uh, but they will all, in the end, run with Docker. And so there is always, for all these services, a way to uh, tweak the, the Docker image itself if you are familiar with this uh, with this, uh, with the technology. Okay. So let's look at the first example, which is this paper space here. Uh, so we just go uh, live. It will be a bit more interesting. But you have in the slide, you have a bit the, the detail. So if you go to... Um, Ah. To paper space, you, this is like a private company. You need to sign in, create an account. This is for free. And then you have all your projects in there and you can create a new project, give it a name. So I would just call this the frag. And then it will ask you if you really want to create a notebook. So yes, you want to create a notebook. And then you will have the opportunity to choose a pre-made environment, okay? These services, they're usually made for people doing machine learning. And so they have all the main machine learning environments set up for you. So if you want to run something in PyTorch, then you just say, okay, let's run it in PyTorch. And then down there, you choose what kind of resource, computing resources you want. And you say, okay, here we will get a free GPU also. So you could say a free GPU or use some more advanced machine that would be much more expensive, okay? So you see here, this machine costs $6 uh, dollar, uh, an hour, for example. So if you have to run it for a week, it's going to be expensive. And there are different flavors of these machines, uh, but essentially we can stay here with uh, the default free one. And then you can say how much time it should run. You see, oh, this is also limited. You cannot run things for a day if you need to do some heavy deep running training. Uh, so there are some limits in there. And then there are advanced options where you can specify a Docker image and other things, uh, but we don't want to go through there. And then you just say start notebook. And it will just take a bit of time to uh, start an instance of Docker and start your Jupyter notebook. But in the end, you will be able uh, to uh, run your notebook as if it were, were running inside your, inside your, uh, on your computer, okay? So you will get, um, let me just skip a few of these slides. So you will get, in the end, you will get here a notebook running inside this paper space um, service. You see the address here is not this local address that you usually have. So it runs remotely, but it looks exactly like the Jupyter that we have seen before, right? And this just runs remotely on the GPU provided by this paper space uh, service. You saw that it's incredibly easy to start. So this is really one of the advantage of these kind of uh, pre-made services. And you also get the free GPU like on Google Cloud in, in this case. Um, you can also upload some data. There are limits there and you have also to pay if you need more. It's unclear where these data are stored. So if you have sensitive data, be careful on what you do. The same counts for Google Drive, right? 
you, if you have medical data, you are not supposed to just uh, upload them uh, randomly. Uh, if you need to customize these things, it can be a bit complicated, right? So it's not straightforward because you have to know a bit about Docker. So if you need the plain uh, environments that are provided by them, that's fine. And you can add more uh, um, software directly in the notebook. And I think the main limitation is it can become expensive, right? So again, it's difficult to manage the costs. Uh, and so you have to be a bit careful, um, a bit careful about this. Okay, so let's look at the three last uh, things which run on public instances. So the first one is Binder. So I would just go to the Binder website and see what they what they what they say. So this is the mybinder.org website, and they tell you that it's a, a a system that turns a Git repo into a collection of interactive notebooks. So what this system, what this uh, service does, is take a repository. So you will have a given repository here that contains maybe notebooks. It contains also maybe a file that says how software should be installed. So for example, in this uh, repository of my microfilm package, there is a little file called environment YAML. So for those who are familiar with Python, you know these files. So this is the list of, so of packages that should be installed. So what Binder is going to do is just read this information, copy over all the notebooks, and use a little cool a tool called repo to Docker uh, to turn all this into a small Docker image. Okay, And then this will run in the cloud, a cloud that is paid by universities and some foundations. And you will be able to run your notebook interactively. Okay, So we'll try this afterwards. We'll create a, a small repository and try to run this. In the end, what you can do is create a little button on your own repository if you want, and then you can just start it from there. But for the sake of the of the example, I will just do it live here. So you just copy the address of your GitHub repository. You don't need any login, right? It's free for everyone. Paste it here and then say launch. And if you run it already, it's already built, so you don't have to create a new image, so it's fast. If you never did it, it's going to take some time to create that image and push it to the right place. Uh, but here it will launch my, uh, my server, right? So this is entirely running in the cloud. I had nothing to do, just copy pasted a GitHub address. And now I have a Jupyter instance that is starting, right? And it runs on a remote cloud. And uh, just to convince you, I can create a notebook and I can import uh, NumPy as MP. So this all runs, right? It's interactive, it's not a static file. And then I can open the notebooks I made here and try to uh, try to run them. Okay. Again, you see that this interface is exactly the same as if you were running on your own uh, laptop. Okay. So this is Binder, a really cool service for demonstrations. Um, the limitations is the amount of computing resources you get. So it's very limited since it's entirely for free and open to anyone. And the sessions are temporary. So it's not to do actual real work. It's really more to share things, to share workflows, to show to people how they work, to share, to let people try things out, even for very short courses, uh, but not to do actual real work, right? And there is no way to save your, your data in there. You can do also other things like using RStudio, for example, in there. You can even run in a desktop and run Napari. Uh, so there is lots of possibilities. So the next example is Renku. So Renku is a service provided by the Swiss Data Science Center, but it is open to everyone. And that the goal is to uh, do reproducible and collaborative uh, data analysis. And it's based on a series of technologies. So it's based on GitLab, which is almost like GitHub, that hosts your code, your notebooks, and your data. And then it accesses to the cloud via this Renku software that you can also install on, on your cluster at your university if you want. And this via Docker again is going to run uh, your, your notebooks, okay? And the advantage here is that you can keep your changes. So you're using Git, you can commit your changes that you make in your repository and commit them to, to GitLab. So you can keep your, 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 your modifications. So this resource you can actually use to do uh, real work in that sense, right? You work on a project to keep uh, track of your changes. 
so you can log in via GitHub. So this is why I said you can make a GitHub uh, account if you want to access, for example, uh, to this. And as I was mentioning, uh, you can run it on your own infrastructure, but they have a, a public instance called Rankulab IO uh, that, where you can run these things. So this is my account. I have a few projects again running. You can create a new project, give it a name. Right? It's very similar in all these services, say if you want to keep it public or, or private. And then a bit like before, you can use like a pre-made image that will contain some basic information. So you, if you have a Python project, an R project, a bioconductor project, you can also have a remote desktop if you want. And then you will say create project and this will just start making an image and run your, your notebook. Okay. And so this is again, this will, I don't want to do it now for the sake of time, but it will run again a session, this time at regular.io. Again, you get your Jupyter interface. Um, yes, this I explained. And the, the interesting thing, so you have again this Docker file here that you can modify. So you can add more software. This is if you're a bit more advanced, you can install software via Linux. You can also update these requirements and environment files to install packages. And the interesting mechanism is if you start modifying one, this, one of these files, you will commit them to Git uh, lab. So you will modify and then say, yeah, I want to commit, keep the, that change. And when you do that, Renku will detect that automatically and say, oh, he wants now to have a new Docker image, a new environment where this is installed. So I'm going to rerun it. So there is an automated system on GitLab that will just take this into account. And for you, without you knowing it, right? You don't never have to look at this. This is just for, for you to understand the technology behind this it will rerun the, the, uh, uh, the creation of this image, right? So you see, I made a commit here uh, at some point and it's running the image build uh, pipeline. So it's making a new image. And eventually I will have a new instance of Jupyter running with this new package that I wanted to install, okay? So everything is done behind the scenes when you do these commits, uh, but uh, it allows you to really have an environment exactly as you want um, and not, uh, it's not too difficult to do, right? You just have basically to edit these files like you would do uh, in, in a regular case. You can also upload data. So they use some system from Git called Git LFS to upload data. It's limited. So if you have terabytes of data, you cannot do use the, the, that system. But for demos, for courses, it's really optimal. And um, yes, yeah, so the advantage is that it combines data and computing. Uh, unlike Binder, where you don't have data, for example, you can keep your changes. Uh, just like Binder, you can also run other things like RStudio and Napari if you want. And you can edit this Docker file for maximum uh, freedom. The interesting thing is that you can create shareable and run runnable uh, uh, versions of your, uh, of your project. So if I copy paste this somewhere where I'm not logged in, right? So you can also try if you want. Um, right. Uh, you get the button there that anybody can start. And when you click on that button, it will start a session. So if you want to share this with people, you can just uh, tell them, give them the link to this button and it will start this interactive session um, for them. They won't be able to save anything, but they can uh, edit and uh, run your notebooks if they want to actually keep changes and uh, maybe edit and, and um, keep changes, they can make a, a login and uh, copy your project or, or reuse your project. Okay, so again, this is like on Binder, depending how many people are using the service, it, may, it takes a different amount of time to start, but eventually it will start. So we just leave it uh, running there and we will come back a bit later and see if something, if something, something happens. So it takes, sometimes uh, two, three minutes before it starts. Uh, this is one of the negative sides, right? It can take time to update when you are rebuilding. And you have also on this public instance limited resources, right? So you have up to, I think, uh, four or eight cores. You don't have access to GPU. Uh, so it's also more for teaching and for demonstrations, but you can install a private instance of this. So there are universities in, in Switzerland that have installed Renku on their cluster. And so people get this kind of easier access to uh, high HPC uh, via this, uh, this system. 
Okay, so the last tool that I want to talk about is this galaxy that was mentioned already. I always get kind of lost of who, who pays for what in the EU. But uh, so this is run by the, um, the Freiburg Galaxy team at the University of Freiburg in Germany. And it runs on their cluster, if I understand correctly. And so this is a bioinformatics tool at the beginning, mostly used for genomics, I would say. And it's a web-based platform that allows you to do these workflows. So I think in following courses, you are going to actually learn about uh, how to make workflows. We use a kind of a special part of uh, Galaxy that gives us access to their cloud. So they have also a big cloud and we want to get access to it uh, via Jupyter Notebooks. And they have a special service called uh, Interactive Environment that uh, run Jupyter or RStudio. And that is a bit separate from the classical way of using Galaxy uh, via these workflows that people in bioinformatics uh, use. So I won't talk too much about, I won't talk about workflows because I think you will hear about this in later sessions. I will just explain to you how you can use this um, for uh, Jupyter. Um, yeah, this is a bit like Renku that you can keep your changes also. So this is a service you can actually use also for, 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 for read work. So this is a statement. So this is the goal of these kind of services is to make things accessible, reproducible. You have heard these words already a, a few times. So you can access this service. Uh, so if you made a login, you can access uh, to, to, to this uh, use Galaxy service. And you have access to pre-installed tools. So these tools are here in this left panel here. Um, and these are mostly bioinformatics tools. You, if you search, you will find also image processing tools. Uh, and I think those will be used. I think uh, Robert has a gives, gives this lecture uh, on how to use this, uh, this workflow uh, from, from there. And this entire thing already runs in Docker, actually. And so when we use Git, uh, when you use Jupyter inside um, this service, we run Docker inside Docker, right? It's a bit like Inception. Um, uh, so it's kind of amazing that this uh, works. So the similar thing to projects that we had in Paperspace or the projects we had uh, we saw in Renku. This is called here a history. So you can have multiple histories. These histories, they contain your data, they contain your notebook, and they contain even the running instances of, uh, of, uh, of Jupyter. So this is basically what is a project in this, in this interface. You can upload data also. You can upload data from your computer. Uh, you can upload data from a web service like Zenodo or GitHub. Um, and you can also upload them from known data banks. From what I could see, uh, there is no imaging data bank, but I might be wrong. Uh, I've, I have the impression for the moment there is only uh, genomics uh, data banks. If somebody knows better, uh, please uh, let me know. Okay, and then you get these kind of interfaces. We, we can test this afterwards to upload, uh, upload data. And for Jupyter, so Jupyter is a special class, as I was saying, for these interactive tools. And there is a thing called JupyTool. So if you actually go to uh, Galaxy, right? And here you start typing Jupyter tool, it will subselect the tools that contains uh, Jupy. And you see here this interactive JupyTool notebook. Okay, so this is the tool you have to select if you want to run notebook. If you click on this, it will open this window and start asking you if you want to start with a fresh notebook. We want to start with a fresh notebook. You can add uh, automatically inputs that you have stored in your history. You will probably learn about this uh, also in later sessions. We, we do it in a simple way. And then we just execute. And so when you say execute, this is the step that actually starts your Jupyter server. And that will give you access to a Jupyter instance in Docker in Docker. Uh, and then you will be able to access to it. So we will do that in the exercise afterwards. So to access then this resource, you have to go into your user account here on the top and go to active interactive tools. So if you click on this, you will see a list of your interactive tools that are running. So I started playing around with this, uh, you see 11 years, uh, 11 years, 11 days ago, and it's still running, right? So this is one, I think, one of the really great advantages of this service is uh, there is a limit, but I forgot exactly how much it is, but it's not in days, right? It's, it's, it's very long sessions. So you can keep working on a project for a very long time and it keeps on being active, right? So your notebook is somewhere active. You can access to it uh, whenever you want. 
So if you, you uh, click select one of your sessions, it will open again a Jupyter session, right? And for the fourth time now, I think you have a very similar interface or the same interface as you had before. You see here, we have a few more things installed. I can run a few more things, but in, in principle, we can just create a notebook. And uh, this is again, interactive, okay? Uh, also fairly, fairly easy, uh, fairly easy to use. So this is uh, the thing I showed live. Um, since these things are a bit separate, right? It's Docker inside Docker. You need a way to communicate between these two, especially for data. So you can push and pull data and the notebooks from one to the other. So if you create a notebook into your Jupyter, in your Jupyter session, and don't actively copy it over to Galaxy, it will be lost when you stop your session, okay? So you have to actually push it to Galaxy, a bit like in Renko, you do a commit. Here, you have also to push it. And the same thing in the other direction, right? So if you have data in your session here, and you want to use them in your notebook, you have to push them to Jupyter to be able to use them. So we won't go too much into detail into this, but there are two commands, uh, one which is called get. So you would write get and then look for an ID this is this number that you have here in your, in your data set. And then this gets imported in this location, right? So if you're in your Jupyter notebook, now this data set is called 18 and you can uh, import it from this, uh, this location. And the same for uh, saving a notebook. You can put your notebook and it will appear in your Galaxy environment uh, when you actually execute this, this, uh, this cell that says put my, my, my notebook in there. Okay, so this is, I would say a bit, probably the, the pain point of this solution, this kind of communication, but otherwise it's a, it's a, it's a great tool. So you can run or use the default environment that is provided, but you can also create new environments with Conda. And I just put this as an information for those who are familiar with Python, you can test it afterwards. For those who are not, um, uh, you can try to uh, learn more about Python. Uh, but this is uh, allow you, allowing you to create a new environment with software that you decide to install. And it will appear here in this window. So when you want to create a new notebook, as I did in my own case here, I created an environment where I installed uh, Cellpose, for example. Okay, so I have a specific Conda environment where Cellpose is installed. So when I create a notebook from this, I get access to... Uh, Cell pose, which doesn't come, uh, yeah, it doesn't come. It doesn't uh, come by default in this uh, inst installation. They have installed many packages, but not highly specialized ones uh, like uh, like these. Okay, so it's very easy to start. Um, you have large computational resources. This is very nice. I'm not entirely sure this. We will probably see in the next uh, courses if you can control this. Uh, but uh, from what I could find that you have access to massive resources and you have up to 250 gigabytes of uh, storage okay so which is a good start a reasonable start uh, to do actual uh, research uh, that you can upload uh, to, to this service there is no simple way that i found to keep environments so if you create an environment just uh, let it run uh, and if uh, your session stops then you have to restart your environment if you do it in the proper way this should not be not be uh, too much of a problem. And the data import export, I find a bit cumbersome, uh, but maybe there is a better solution that, uh, than what I'm doing here. Um, uh, but I think this is, uh, you will see all these limitations in all the software. So this is a bit the overview that I wanted to give you. Uh, you see that there is no perfect solution, right? So some solutions are extremely easy to run like Binder, uh, but limited in terms of computational power. Some others are really great like Galaxy, but a bit cumbersome in handling things like data processing. Uh, things like paper space are great, but very expensive. So there is no perfect solution at the, at, the, at the time. So depending on your application, if it's a course, if it's a demonstration, a, an article you want to publish, uh, if you work in a company and have infinite money, then uh, you can go to paper space. Uh, so it really depends on, your, on, the, on the situation, okay? So with this, I will uh, thank you for your, uh, for your attention.